All right, our first witness is Catherine Bentham. And we have people who are handed out the, uh, um, I'm going to call it uh, compromise language regarding the RMP. So maybe you could sure. take I'm it from there. I'm Catherine Bentham from the Joint Fiscal Office, and you have a one-page sheet that says proposed motion at the top. And I'm actually going to drop to the bottom just to remind you the capital bill language is at the bottom. So the money was appropriated for BGS to do um, assess relative cost and resource requirements for correctional facility. And you all and joint fiscal have to approve um, approve the, the funding of this before they can use money. And so you all, I believe last meeting, passed a motion that went to joint fiscal and joint fiscal struggled with the motion. So um, in, the, in the interim, Several legislators got together and tried to, and we worked with the administration. Uh, Jane Kitchell, Senator Jane Kitchell was involved with this, as we're uh, the chair and vice chair of this committee, thinking through this. Um, so I believe the language that you had at the top of the page represents something that is uh, maybe clearer and more uh, understandable to people. And I, uh, the commissioner from Corrections is here to speak to how this dovetails with the other work on what they, the administration thinks of this language. I, I wasn't going to read it unless you wanted me to, Senator. Sears. No, that's fine. Uh, I think uh, Mike Duchette, the Commissioner of Corrections, is probably the best person to talk about whether this meets, this is doable. And we don't certainly want, don't want to create more headaches for the Commissioner. But, Either. Well, uh, so I'm Mike Duchette, the Commissioner of Corrections, and I really appreciate you thinking of my headaches, and that's, uh, uh, <laughs> that's really appreciated. I think uh, so the language that is drafted here uh, meets the Department of Corrections needs and, and goals. And if, if I may, maybe just take a couple of minutes and, and talk about why this language, I think, is in support of uh, the direction and the need that we have. First and foremost is as we are uh, uh, re-engaged in justice and reinvestment and looking at how we can first prevent people from entering the judicial system, but as importantly, as people do become uh, involved in the justice system, that we understand um, how we can re-enter them back to the communities um, in the best possible way so that they're uh, poised for success. So this dovetails nicely uh, from my perspective in that our facility, particularly Chittenden, uh, where there are no vocational services and there are incredibly limited space to offer other program services. When we know, all the evidence is very clear from our perspective that vocational services, program services, mental health services are key to successful reentry. We're not able to fulfill many of those obligations due to just physical infrastructure ability currently. So when we look at justice reinvestment, this has the, the opportunity to help us achieve better outcomes by better um, uh, planning and work with the population so that when they do re-enter, they're, they're re-entering with the skills and the tools and the knowledge that, th that they need to be most successful. So in that respect, I think this dovetails quite nicely with justice reinvestment. Um, for those of you who have visited Chittenden lately, uh, I think you would probably agree with my summation here of that facility. Uh, it is dark, it is cramped, it is loud. Um, I, I've testified to this before, but I want to reiterate this, that when we have a population, particularly women, and, and men too, but women are uh, nationally, and in Vermont, 95% of women are victims of trauma, sexual violence, domestic violence. That in itself, and I don't want to make that an excuse for why they're incarcerated and the behaviors they've conducted. But when we're considering, when the department is considering how we best work with that individual to prepare them for reentry so that they can be successful, um, we have to consider that. And I would, I would uh, espouse that the current condition of that facility does not support good mental health, good physical health, and the opportunity to engage in program services that will truly benefit not only the individual, the offender, but our communities as well in improving public safety. I don't want to miss out on the opportunity here to um, highlight some national studies relative to the health and well-being of our staff. 
The mortality rates of correctional officer staff is horrendous. Substance abuse, domestic violence, crime, suicide are prevalent among this workforce. In part, I think we can help shape a, an environment where staff can be healthy and well. In many of our facilities, our staff have no place to go take a break. On a critical incident, they have no place to go and just decompress for a couple minutes. If they're ordered over, ordered in, working 12 to 16 hours a day, they have no place to go take a break so that they can do their jobs and do it in a way that is positive and pro-social. Working that many hours in a loud environment, which quite frankly is depressing at times in and of itself because of the infrastructure, um, makes our, tire, our staff tired and they make mistakes. And that's, that's not a criticism against our staff, that's in, that's in support of our staff, that we can not only achieve better outcomes with our population, but I think we have an opportunity here to evaluate how we can support our staff in a workforce that is healthy and invigorated to do the challenging work that lies ahead. Uh, as we've heard previously uh, from BGS, uh, we're looking between five to seven years of construction time and all the, all the planning and work that needs to happen. Secretary Gobey testified several years ago that it's time to get a shovel on the ground. I couldn't agree more. We're, uh, we're five to seven years behind the opportunity to do better work in the department, ensure that our taxpayers have confidence in the mission and the work the department is carrying out, and we improve public safety. All of these things together, I think this language is in the right direction and supports not only the Department of Corrections goals in uh, promoting public safety and providing people that are in our, our population and our custody the opportunity to be successful. It also is an opportunity for us to recognize how difficult this work is on staff and giving them the opportunity to have a break and work in an environment that is not as stressful as we've created. Nationally, since the war on crime, we have built prisons around this country that are built for one purpose, and that's containment. Uh, and, and if that's our goal, is just containment, as opposed to really working with individuals to re-enter successfully, reduce crime rates, reduce recidivism rates, uh, we have an opportunity to hear things to think strategi strategically about how we do this in a thoughtful way that addresses the trauma and the needs of not only the population, but our staff. Could uh, I ask that? Uh, you work with the State Employees Association um, to put together a presentation on some of these things. When Certainly. We visit St. Albans on the 8th of November. Be happy to do that. Um, that would allow us to look at what's going on nationally and as well as in the state. And actually, I've been working with former Colonel of the State Police, Jim Baker, who is interested in dealing with the suicide problem of first responders and police officers and so forth. And, we're and uh, uh, there will be a bill. Uh, he's, he, I, I told him I would put together a bill. And obviously, I got Luke involved, and I haven't had heard back from Luke on it, what the bill will look like. But it would be a commission to look at this problem and try to deal with it. And certainly, um, this is emerging because this this workforce uh, has, particularly the Department of Corrections, has been an understudied workforce for the last ten years as people are starting to do evaluations. There's an interesting study out of Pew that says correctional officers experience higher rates of PTSD than combat war veterans. That's stunning. Not shock, not surprising, but stunning. Yeah. If you could, you know, Certainly. if there's people that you can think of who would be good, if you'd work with Peggy and, uh, and myself and Alex on <laughs> putting together um, some, I mean, I don't want just a session where we just talk about, well, we're understaffed and we need 50 more employees and we know the administration probably won't support that. But I'd really like to talk about what things we need to do and how much understaffing. Is there, is there an understaffing? I mean, I know the issue came up, but... Uh, so I think the, the evaluation of how we can support a healthy workforce yeah. is key to keeping a, a, a strong workforce well, I know, with us. You know, it's true in the community as well with the, the probation officers. I spent some time last session talking with a group of probation officers who were very worried about the environments that they had to go into today. Absolutely. I think um, having been there and done that myself and walking into a home where you see children that are in an impoverished situation, 
Um, it's it's heartbreaking, quite frankly. But, uh, but I think that's one of the also areas. dangerous situations that they're asked to walk into that's right. as well. Yeah. Um, Commissioner, the other day in Springfield, you talked about a committee. I believe you talked about a committee that was looking at recruitment and retention. That's correct. So the department, um, uh, about a year ago, we initiated uh, an internal leadership development course. Can we save that for sure. another Sorry. time? Okay. Just to get this mm -hmm. issue, I want to yeah. make sure we vote on this. Are there questions about this particular? I, I did have a question about how this, um, the RFP and this language would tie into the Council of State Government study of what's necessary. Is the timing going to coincide mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. so that it will be informed, you know, the, the RFP will be informed by we, that? We did that with capital information? Yeah, I, from my perspective, this actually complements the work that CSG is doing quite nicely. I believe it will be December when they okay. have Work. Right, Council of State Governments, the Justice Reinvestment 2 will be in December. So this language here in terms of working with BGS, because BGS is the driving force here more, more so. You've got to coordinate with BGS. In the Capitol Bill, we said this review <clears throat> in terms of different scales of facilities or how you do it will be presented to us by the middle of March. And the Capitol Bill also said that BGS needs to really look at the results of, re of Justice Reinvestment 2 to incorporate that within the buildings. So we have that in the Capitol Bill. And I, that leads into a statement that I just want to make sure that this does not, this is not in place of the Council of State Government's Justice Reinvestment. This is just superseded. Right. So I just want everyone to be clear about that, that it's in tandem. Don't. I'm not that. <laughs> and I just. I would like to hear what else you have. And, and I just well, want to I'm know thinking. what conversations you have had with the commissioner of BGS pertaining to this language um, and where the commissioner of BGS is on this. I did actually have a conversation with Commissioner Cole earlier this week. We reviewed the language. We're both in agreement that this. Uh, this language is um, will support the needs of the department as we look forward to um, our infrastructure needs. Uh, so he is also in agreement that this language is appropriate and uh, facilitates the work we'd like to do. BGS is the one that has to go out with the RFP. That's correct. Did he give you a timeline on that? We didn't get into timelines on that, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the... Bill and then Judith. Go ahead. Me um, just wondering about the relationship. Unfortunately, I haven't missed the last meeting, and it seems like the motion that we passed to okay the money had some limitations on size, and this seems sort of deliberately to move away from limitations on size. Just wondering what the uh, what the what produced that change? Well, I think joint fiscal, and Mary may be able to speak to that. I missed the joint fiscal meeting due to some personal issues. Yeah. So the joint fiscal committee was not, not in support. They tabled the language that we presented, that we voted on. And in particular, we're concerned about the, about the limitations on the scope of the work and this specifically not looking at the larger size. I, there was a conversation about the cost of operating the, you know, the kind of the dispersed model that we have now. It was noted that we're spending $21 million on healthcare costs because we run such a, a, a dispersed model. And so I think that's the reason, so that was the concern there. I'm assuming, I, I was not part of drafting this, but I, I'm sure that this was attempting to respond to that. And if you look at this, it talks about the multiple in-state locations. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we have now. And then the campus style, um, which would be presumably a larger facility. Um, so I. 
That's the best I have an answer in, in response okay. to you. JFC was concerned about, about limiting and not getting sufficient data to understand the costs of operating a diverse sort of model versus a more centralized model. If I okay, and I, and I, uh, I intuited that. Yeah. I guess my question is rather what this committee's reaction was specifically to having that removed. Um, if anybody could recap that. That's where we're reacting right now. Okay. okay. This is our first meeting since that. Oh, I see. So, yeah. so we that, didn't talk about it. Yeah, we didn't miss anything because we didn't talk about it. We just it. handed okay. out the language. We just handed out the language at the last meeting so people were prepared for it. I think my reaction is that they know they know where this committee stands regarding an 800-bed facility or anything of that nature. Unless somebody can actually show us how that would be superior to the current smaller facilities around the state you know obviously there's considerations but you know I think the first it's fair to say that it would be a tough sell to get to an 800 bed facility but if you want to do a campus style situation that would be allowed to look at that for me it's a tough sell I shouldn't speak for the committee. Mm -hmm. I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I can't support an 800-bed facility. I agree. That would replace all the small facilities. No, it doesn't. That, well, I don't that's this the is issue. What we have to it doesn't. See. It doesn't. The language in, the, in this draft says mm -hmm. capacity of the system required to meet the needs of identified inmate groups. So uh, it seems to me that that implies what we have as a population mm -mm. and what we... How have. many folks do we have incarcerated? Uh, about uh, 1,500 in... No, system-wide, not just in state, oh, but our Mississippi folks as uh, well. 17-something? 17, 1752-ish, yeah. I think. So we have 200 and... 76. Okay, so how many out of state do we have? So for rounding off the numbers, if we have 1,770 folks incarcerated mm -hmm. and 270 are out of state, that leaves us with 1,500? Yeah. How many general population beds do we have that are not restricted in use? Or uh, how many restricted beds do we have that you can't be flexible with? We're going to present that at 1 o'clock because I, I, okay. I'm sorry, I don't have that uh, right okay. in front of me. I wasn't prepared for that right at the moment. So right now we have 1,760 yeah. folks incarcerated. Yeah. If I could offer my evaluation of how this language and the justice center can, can I ask a question sure. before we do that? I, one of the things that we asked for uh, at the end of the session, I think that, that we're working with Senator Sears and with you on the health, the whole health care piece, which is uh, integral to any decision making, it is to look at access to local facilities and community facilities, and if uh, because that will that has a distinct effect on whether or not there's a campus and where the campus might be as compared with accessing local hospitals, local uh, treatment facilities. And uh, so I would hope that that is part of this conversation. Right. So I think the language does support that because mm -hmm. it does evaluate specifically uh, oh, sites. Okay, which because we're getting a report on that, I know that. Correct. And then um, the other piece is, uh, the concerns that were brought to us from the community and of course uh, the programmatic concerns that do help people maintain their mental health while they're incarcerated but then also uh, as they leave to re-enter with their families in a way that isn't disruptive. So uh, I'm hope, I, I'm, it says community reintegration, transitional supports, the, the question would be while folks are in the facility, facility-based treatment and programming, and I'm just wanting to know that the, the people who are incarcerated in South Burlington who may be removed from their families, 
um, that they're maintaining contact with their families, where whatever happens with that facility. That's, that, that is obvious, that, that is a goal that we always strive for. The connections with family and friends uh, is truly important uh, to individuals, uh, not only upon reentry, but also for their general well being while they are incarcerated. So, that is certainly something that we will continue to ensure is available. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Senator Sears. So, I think we as a group, and we as a legislature need to move away from the number of 850. Yeah. 850 was a number that was in a report that came out over two years ago. Things are fairly fluid uh, in the corrections arena. And those numbers are changing even, the, even the, as we learned in the House side last year that those numbers change dramatically. The services that a facility may need change dramatically. And so I, I think if we fixate on 850, uh, we're, we're wrong. We are wrong. And I'm, I'm hoping that this language, and I'm fairly reasonably certain that this language along with the CSG group uh, will bring to us uh, uh, different models that we can either choose from, accept, reject, or whatever. But I think 850 is, is just, was just a number. And I think it was a number that people fixated on, and I, I'm hoping that we can, we can move away from that. It might be, who knows what it's going to be. But that was a, a number that came from the administration after we asked for a number, as this committee and, and the legislature asked for, asked for something. And it was supplied, and everybody was, were, was a little taken aback. So, well, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I think there will be a, some disagreement on this committee regarding the numbers, but I will say that perhaps part of the angst came from the fact that there was a discussion of course Civic owning the facility mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. having a lease to the mm -hmm. state, and that led to mm -hmm. the idea that there would be private prisons in Vermont. So I think that right. was mm -hmm. something that was a bad taste. So is there, are there any questions for Mike or anyone else about Catherine or anyone else about this proposal? I think we Yes. I think we just have to be really clear that this is looking at developing um, the designs of the facilities. Because that's capital dollars. Capital dollars look at the design. The design needs to incorporate those programmings, but BGS isn't going to look at the programming. That's corrections. No, but they're working with the right. Well, that's that's the connection. This language, the two hundred thousand in the capital bill, is looking at the design of the facility to support the program needs of DOC. So it's like getting an estimate. Well, you got to. You can't move forward without an estimate. Different feasibility kinds. study. That's what it is. It's a feasibility study. You're not going to put a shovel in the ground next year. I thought you were winning before you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. No, that. we're not putting a shovel in the ground. No, but it's two hundred thousand to go for an RFP. I think you were winning. I know. <laughs> you know I know. <laughs> when your head out will stop digging. <coughs> For some of the rub between the house and the house. Okay, okay. I'll erase yeah. the short last sentence. Is there, are there any other questions for Mike or for Catherine or anyone else about the proposal from the Joint Fiscal Committee? The compromise language. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this will come up and your crew. Yeah. yeah. And this will come up now at the Joint Committee meeting in March. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to have in front of you. There's one slide that's slightly um, in a different place. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, oh, it's 146, not 46? 
Uh, like 146. Yeah, we're, not, we're not prepared to talk to you about education. No. <laughs> oh, good. good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, for the record, Sarah Robinson from the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And good morning, everybody. I'm Karen Bastien. I'm the senior advisor to the commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. So thank you uh, so much for having us today uh, to report on the work of a recently concluded study committee. This is Act 146 of 2018. Um, that examined the use of restorative justice for domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking. Um, and uh, we're excited to be able to share with you uh, the recommendations of that group and discuss what the possibilities are for moving forward. So um, briefly, I just wanted to uh, remind us of the charge and composition of this study group. Uh, the study group was charged with examining whether restorative justice can be an effective process for holding perpetrators of domestic and sexual violence and stalking accountable while also preventing for the, uh, future crime and keeping victims in the greater community safe. And this was an interdisciplinary study group. There were 19 me uh, seated members of the study group and it included state's attorneys, uh, many state-based uh, state -based advocates, um, we had representatives from the Department for Children and Families, the Attorney General's Office, the Department of Corrections, uh, community-based advocates, restorative justice practitioners, as well as survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking. Here we are. Great. So it's perhaps with a bit of um, measured surprise that um, I, I'm here to speak with you all, and our organization was so um, involved in this conversation. Um, because for decades, domestic and sexual violence advocates uh, viewed the use of restorative justice to address kind of the harms of domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking with a bit of skepticism. Um, I think out of some <coughs> concern that restorative justice could function as some kind of watered down um, version of the criminal justice system. Uh, and uh, that the good news is that um, we're really represented here with a study committee and evolution in that thinking. Um, and in fact, in 2008, uh, it was the network along with several other organizations that uh, advocated to prohibit the community justice centers in Vermont from receiving referrals for domestic and sexual violence. Um, with the exception of kind of limited re-entry contexts. However, uh, for the past several years, there are restorative models in Vermont that are already um, addressing domestic and sexual violence um, and have been, and that includes the COSA model, where uh, returning uh, folks returning from incarceration, um, especially uh, sex offenders, have had great success with that model, uh, less uh, measured success um, with domestic violence offenders. Family group conferencing efforts at DCF, which is a restorative approach, um, often includes families where domestic violence um, is a concern. Uh, the BARS program, the Youth Justice Program run out of DCF, which is also a restorative-based uh, model, works with youth who sexually offend. Um, and there are some very exciting emerging partnerships that uh, are still uh, in evolution with community justice centers functioning as domestic violence accountability programs, formerly known as better intervention programs. And very briefly, I just wanted to highlight two of those. There's two in the state. One is right here in Montpelier, where the Montpelier Community Justice Center offers um, a evidence-based curriculum working with domestic violence offenders. And the other is a new and different model uh, at the Windsor Community Justice Center, and that's a partnership between um, David Cahill, the state's attorney in Windsor, the Windsor Community Justice Center, and our um, member organization, WISE. And um, it's a model that has been adapted, was originally um, developed in the Navajo Nation, and has been adapted and used in Arizona and Utah uh, for domestic violence offenders and is now being used in Windsor um, for misdemeanor domestic violence offenders. And we're really excited about those partnerships. So that's really
really the context in which um, here in Vermont we entered into that conversation. Uh, but there are also really well-established restorative justice approaches to domestic and sexual violence outside of Vermont. Um, certainly internationally, there are many models that have existed for years, um, including some that are, uh, have been well-researched. And the Center for Court Innovation uh, here uh, in the US received a grant from the Department of Justice last year to conduct a broad nationwide survey of programs um, across the country that are using domestic, uh, restorative justice to address domestic and sexual violence. And so all of that is to say that there is certainly a rising interest in uh, what the possibilities might be. And the Center for Court Innovation just recently re released their report um, and identified 34 programs um, across the country that are doing similar work. They actually highlighted the COSA program here in Vermont in that report. Um, and so there are many models that we can look at um, and look to and learn from. So Karen's gonna talk a little bit about the committee process itself. Okay, so hello again. Um, so part of the reason I'm here in this role, because um, I'm usually in front of you um, uh, speaking on different topics is that um, I was actually the chair of this group, and so Sarah and I worked very closely together to um, design these meetings. And um, as you might imagine, with a topic so, uh, with two merging two topics that are so incredibly nuanced, um, the committee um, undertook a lot of work um, in order to um, get us to the point where we are today with a set of recommendations. And so. Um, uh, so the group prepared for this work by um, reading national articles and hearing from presenters and um, discussing the, the current sets of programs in Vermont. And one of the outgrowths of the first or second meeting is that um, the group was clear that they that hearing from survivors was, uh, was of utmost importance. Um, and what we were able to do because of the committee composition is do a lot of cross-training and sharing of expertise uh, with respect to either domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking, and, um, or restorative justice. Uh, the group met 11 times, and uh, more than half of those meetings were three hours or longer. So this group definitely had to get into the thick of it to um, fully understand the scope of this. So I thought I'd first share with you what we learned from survivors and also to share with you how we incorporated their input. So we actually had two, two members of the study committee, our survivors themselves, and um, they very willingly and um, we very graciously uh, shared their um, experiences in the system. Uh, we actually provided a number of opportunities for them to provide um, direct testimony to the committee um, um, as to what they would have liked, should, could there have been a restorative justice option for them. And then uh, moreover, we, um, the network actually conducted um, a survey um, of which 136 survivors responded to. Um, and then finally, the, the network also conducted four um, uh, 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 focus groups, and you can see them listed here. Uh, one was at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, one was at a community justice center, another was at a Vermont network program, and finally there was one that was at a culturally specific community center. So from all of that information, this is what we learned from survivors about whether or not restorative justice is an, is a, is an option that they thought was a good one for um, uh, dealing with domestic violence. Can you take some stuff. questions now, or would you rather? Just a quick one. Were all of these in the Chittenden College? No, no, they were not. They were all over the state, but we're being intentionally okay. vague about locations. Thank you. No, they uh, intentionally avoided Rutland County. Right. Uh, no problem. Thanks. <laughs> sure. They went to Bennington. <laughs> they bypassed Rutland. Yeah, I was just yeah. curious. Yeah. Uh, I am happy to go through this and take questions. I, I'm very sorry, but I am going to have to leave at 5 to 11. But Sarah, Oh, we'll be done. We'll be done. Okay. Yeah, we, we intentionally made this as brief um, and succinct as possible. So we thought you all might want to hear um, what we learned from survivors. So um, not surprisingly, one of the conclusions was that a more nuanced understanding of domestic violence, sexual violence, and, and stalking is needed within the current system. And I'm sure that's not going to come as a surprise to um, you all. Um, it is especially challenging for victims who are also parents. There was a lot of discussion and comments about that. Um, these crimes can cause extreme financial hardship. 
Um, and uh, being able to access peer support is very important. Um, restorative justice for these, uh, for the folks who responded is an attractive option, but they also were clear that they'd like to see some improvements to the current system. And um, finally, that it would be important to have options available at multiple points after harm occurs. One of the things that we know is that it can take time before somebody's willing to come forward to share their story. Um, and that um, it may be even after they participated in a court process that they realized that they would like the opportunity to have a restorative process. So we, that definitely came out that no matter where you are in the system, um, that it would be helpful to have options. Um, Sarah covered this a little bit, but uh, wanted to make sure that um, you, you all have this in front of you as well, is that we have a number of Vermont restorative approaches. Like one of the things that um, I've been learning with my other hat on um, with the juvenile justice reform work is that um, nationally other states are incredibly impressed with the um, infrastructure that we have in place to provide community-based restorative justice options you know, a, a, across a range of needs. And so with respect to that, Sarah covered some of these with respect to what they do for um, domestic violence and sexual violence, but also just wanted you all to see the list of, of restorative approaches, of approaches currently used in Vermont um, that this group actually dug into quite a bit. So in the child welfare and youth justice context, Sarah mentioned the COSA, there's also victim offender dialogues. Um, and then I think all of you are probably familiar with the community-based restorative justice programs, which includes BARGE, court diversion, and the Community Justice Center, as well as domestic violence accountability partnerships. And one of the early conclusions of this group was a deep appreciation for the existing approaches um, and also um, a recognition that the current infrastructure of community-based restorative justice programs are a major asset to our state, but are not currently structured to support the work of handling domestic violence and sexual violence and stalking. So with that, I think it probably makes sense for us to move into the, uh, the recommendations of the group. So, um, and I'm not quite sure why that happened, but now the remote connection is disconnected. So we're just gonna well, we've carry, all got, yeah, we've got we're gonna carry on. Go um, so for the recommendations, uh, one of the things that I wanted to explain is that um, that the committee really uh, mapped out uh, different approaches based on community-based options. So that this would be for somebody who does not uh, you know, want to report to the police and or that example that I shared before, maybe already has been through the system but is looking for support um, outside of the system. Um, we also looked at system involved. Um, so what I mean by that is that a person could request a restorative process irrespective of what's happening with their case. So um, things that exist like that that are already in play um, include the victim offender dialogue, which can happen um, for somebody who is incarcerated um, that a victim would request for a victim offender dialogue. Um, there's also the Parallel Justice Commission um, in Chittenden County, which is comprised of a number of multidisciplinary um, leaders who actually hear from victims of crime and then work to address the issues that the victim um, brings up, and we consider that to be a restorative process. And then finally, I think what you all are familiar with are the more system-driven um, approaches with respect to restorative justice. So that includes COSA, but that also includes when somebody is um, as basically assigned or referred to a uh, restorative justice process. And so the group believes that there is potential in all three of these spheres, spheres and um, as I mentioned, we heard loud and clear from victims that they want to see restorative justice options within the system as well as options that they can access in the community. So uh, without further ado, the first recommendation was that, um, not surprisingly, Vermont should continue to study and explore restorative justice options um, as a response to domestic violence, sexual violence, and, ex and um, examine whether or if restorative justice is an appropriate intervention in stalking cases. Um, because of the complexities of the conversation um, around stalking, um, I, one, of the, one of the conclusions of the group is that um, that, that needed further, a further study. And as a matter of fact, we don't have good examples to draw upon in the same way that we do for domestic violence and sexual violence. So that would need a lot more, um, a lot more studying, so. 
in many cases, there isn't a relationship between the victim and the stalker. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And the rates of lethality can be much higher. Although the stalker the thinks there's a relationship. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, second, the committee uh, strongly recommended that there be some uh, programmatic criteria for organizations or entities utilizing restorative justice to address domestic and sexual violence. Um, and the committee began to discuss what these criteria may be, although um, we're recommending that there be um, so that they be formalized by a body or agency that's authorized um, to create these criteria. But some of the things that came up in our discussion um, were things like um, voluntary engagement by the offender and victim, uh, a defined approach that's based on either evidence or an established body of knowledge. Uh, facilitators who are trained in the dynamics of domestic and sexual violence, um, and demonstrated trauma-informed program elements, among others. Before we move on from that, um, so I know this is a, a kind of budding discussion, but was the idea more along the lines of accreditation, like a, a program would be developed independently and then accredited, or would it be top-down Good question. Um, we had discussed various models, including some kind of certification process, um, like the domestic violence accountability programs um, currently uh, move through. And we didn't reach a conclusion on that, but um, felt that there should be some established criteria and that programs that are offering these kinds of um, programs ought to somehow uh, need to demonstrate their really readiness to be able to offer those. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next recommendation was that Vermont should accelerate its commitment to procedural justice reforms, especially as they relate to legal responses to domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking. What um, does that mean? Yes, I know. So that's interesting. So many years ago, I was actually at a, court, a Center for Court Innovation conference, and they presented a study to us on procedural justice. And this was actually more focused on um, how offenders experience the system. And what they saw is that when, offender, when an offender reported that they fully understood um, the process and that it was transparent, that actually they were more likely to comply with their conditions of release uh, because they felt more empowered. And so kind of in this context, what we're, what we're meaning is just that, that uh, the process is understandable to all, that uh, there is strong communication, um, you know, this is something that we heard a, was a big theme from um, survivors who had actually been through the system, is that it just did not meet their needs and they felt that they didn't have a voice. So I think procedural justice is a way of addressing, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it, it encapsulates that ability to really be respectful of all those who are involved in the process. I would also mention that we saw an overlap between procedural justice and restorative justice in that um, procedural justice is concerned not just with the outcomes of a, of a particular disposition, but with the process itself and the extent to which both victims um, and offenders feel like the process is fair. Yes. You know, that could be said for everyone going through the court system. Yeah. We agree. Absolutely. We absolutely agree. Why? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and that's certainly the juvenile system. Yeah. Yes. Uh, many people don't understand what they're going through. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. Uh, we also thought that there Sometimes was. Sometimes I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> when you were juvenile? <laughs> no, when I was working in the field. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard to understand what the judge really meant. Well, right. so one, one thing that occurs to me is even as we sit here and listen to your testimony is the speed at which this is happening. And I think the speed at which some of these procedures occur is... Let me give you a concrete example. Somebody says you shall not associate with so-and-so. That seems pretty clear cut. But if you run into so-and-so at the store, have you now violated, violated your conditions your when I had no when you had no idea that person was going to be there, and then you get a complaint from the victim saying he was at the store when I was at the store. Yeah. I'm just talking That's about sort of what happens at a hearing where people are just bombarded with either the conditions or you know the, right. the legalese and and it's difficult simply to understand. Yeah. And, and certainly one thing we experience is uh, 
there can be cases where a victim might have a civil order of protection and there might be um, orders related to some kind of criminal prosecution, of, for example, domestic violence, and those conditions are actually in conflict with one another. One requires, for example, visitation, and the other is a stay away order. Um, and so those are the areas where we feel like a commitment to that process being clearer and more transparent for both parties um, will lead to better outcomes. Who is the central, or what, which is the central entity response? Is this a court problem? Is this state's attorneys? Is, who, to whom do we turn to say, yeah. okay, how do we figure this out? Everybody. I would is say it's it everybody in yes. some way okay. structures. I mean, the system is yeah. created and based on a whole set of language mm -hmm. and a culture that yeah. I think if you're not used to engaging in it, you have no basis to understand it. And then I think for Senator Sears' point, I mean, we hear too um, from prosecutors and um, you know uh, our staff that it can be confusing even for those who are person. Um, if you don't mind, I think if we could move through this, and, and um, I'm going to put Sarah on the spot and let her take some, some of the additional questions that you all have. Yeah. Uh, we also felt that there was a a lot of opportunity to expand victim voice and voluntary participation in just the current array of offerings. Um, so while all of the restorative approaches that currently function in Vermont um, do hold the value of being victim-centered, the actual experience of victims participating in those processes is very limited. All of the referrals, almost all the referrals for almost every restorative justice offering in the state, the, the subject of the referral is the person who caused the harm, it's not the victim. So there are very few opportunities for victims to um, opt in to request any kind of process like that. Um, their participation is really um, often a choice that their offender has been referred to participate and then victims usually have an array of choices about how or whether they'd like to participate. But we feel like there's a lot of opportunities to um, expand those offerings. Um, and then an, a, an area that we saw as ripe for um, potential restorative justice application is uh, with res uh, relief from abuse order processes in family court. Um, you know, before the proceeding happens, um, survivors and victims are actually all together in a room, and then there is an advocate and somebody from the court who walks them through the process. And so I think that that orientation itself is a way to actually um, uh, both support and engage um, victims as well as the process itself. Um, we uh, felt that the uh, family group conferencing that is offered by the Department of Children and Families is an approach that's been proven effective, um, but it's also very labor intensive and it requires um, many staff hours and many hours for the families involved as well. It can involve actually um, family members traveling from out of state to participate in these kinds of conferences. Um, and because of that, the offerings are fairly limited, but we felt like it is such a promising model. It's used across the country um, in various places in a restorative context related to domestic and sexual violence with great success and also outside of the US. And so we felt like expanding those offerings would be beneficial. Um, and I've touched on this before, but that survivors are very clear that um, they would be interested in peer support opportunities. And we actually have a number of models, um, even just next door in Massachusetts, that I think uh, would provide a strong foundation for us to consider that approach. And finally, we felt that there should be public investment in some demonstration projects that are aimed at addressing domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking particularly uh, restorative models that provide survivors an opportunity to um, either opt in or request a process. Um, and we have been looking at some federal funding possibilities. I have to say that um, we were feeling quite hopeful, but with some changes in um, the political environment are feeling less hopeful about that. Um, we thought that there was going to be a solicitation from the Department of Justice related to uh, restorative justice, but it looks like that is not forthcoming at this point. Um, but we feel like there are a lot of opportunities to be looking at investments in these kinds of models that serve the broader justice um, interests uh, and broader justice goals of the state. And perhaps there is even an opportunity to infuse this conversation in the justice reinvestment um, work that is ongoing. Mm -hmm. right, and then so um, in conclusion, um, 
I think this group felt incredibly encouraged, and um, you know, Sarah and I are really excited to be in front of you today to share these initial recommendations that um, you know that this group concluded wholeheartedly that we want to see restorative justice options expanded. And um, there's a significant amount of work to be done, but I think that you know, as you all are aware, that Vermont has an incredibly solid foundation for this uh, work to continue. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I'm yeah. sorry you have to leave, okay. but before you leave, I know there's a number of questions. I have one. Um, a few years back, Vermont embarked on an um, electronic monitoring <coughs> for offenders, and it was a, there was a pilot project in Wyndham County that took in some in Bennington County, and it seemed to be ideal with, for victims of domestic violence as well as the person the person who allegedly committed it or did. And if it has just not, you know, been replicated. And the, to me, the positive thing was that it even enabled the victim to know where the perpetrator was if they wanted to through the electronic monitoring device. And you know, at least in Wyndham and Bennington, there were some really good stories about what happened. I know. There was a guy who delivered furniture, drove a delivery truck. He was going to go to jail. Instead of going to jail, he wore electronic monitoring. Uh, they moved him to dropping the stuff off in Rutland, the furniture that the Rutland store had, the Bennington one. He was able to keep his job, he was able to pay his child support, he was able to work with the victim. And I'm, uh, this was you know, done in conjunction with the victim. Um, and things worked out. Instead of having somebody in jail, we had a, somebody paying, you know, taxes and etc. Yet, when that program, the legislature and the administration, by the time they got finished with it, the program was useless. And I think we, I, the commissioner's not here, but I think we've got about eight people on it now. Um, I, as was there any discussion of type of things we've already done that seemed to work, and then we screwed them up? <laughs> Not quite in that way, but, um, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I think is most interesting about that program is that it occurred um, at, a tight, at the same time that there was the integrated domestic violence court down in Wyndham yep. and Bennington counties. And so those three things in concert with one another, um, that was really, it's a great example of procedural justice working really well in Vermont. The family court process, the criminal court process was integrated. Um, and there was also some level of risk assessment that was involved with who got ankle right, monitor and right. who, who didn't. And so I think those are exactly the kind of um, processes we'd like to see explored further. Yeah, and it's it just, we had a good example of something that worked, and then for whatever reason. I'm just, so thank you for this. See the recommendations here. Do you, will there be a report with more meat on it? Yeah. So there, there is a report. Um, I believe that it's on it's the website. Our, yeah. yeah um, okay. So there is a so, final report, and there's a group of us that are um, continuing to meet. Are there so. suggestions for legislation? That's is that what you're just what I was wondering. Yeah. What, yeah. yeah. There may be, um, but they're not complete. Okay. Okay. And, and I'm assuming. A lot of this is about capacity. <coughs> the CJCs, the other restorative programs have it. So will you be making a recommendation in terms of how we should be expanding the system and specifically what dollars ought to be put toward it? We certainly may be. Um, I think that those, uh, I mean, one of our recommendations is that there is public investment in these models. And so that's what we mean by public investment. And I think that um, the community justice centers are certainly part of the heart of that community-based approach. Um, and also, we realize that those approaches need to happen in partnership with local domestic and sexual violence programs that have the expertise. Mm -hmm. so, so given the national interest in this, are there, in your work, did you identify any federal funding or matching funding that might be available to the state. We were hopeful that there may be some. We believe that there is going to be a solicitation from the De uh, Department of Justice Office of Violence Against Women. Um, and the Center for Court Innovation informed us last week that that 
uh, that element of the solicitation, it doesn't look like is going to be forthcoming at this point. Um, so we continue to look for that. We're also looking at um, whether there are community-based models that can be funded through private funding as well. So um, there are foundations on the national level that are interested in this kind of innovative work, and we continue to um, certainly um, pursue all of those options. Well, if there are legislative yes. suggestions for would you get them to the members of this committee? Well, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Other questions for Sarah? Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Um, the next subject is one that I, we had opportunities, and actually before the opiate crisis hit, we actually had a lot of discussion about how could we deal with it. And obviously, we didn't do as well as we could have. Um, but we did have some preparation, and it has a way of starting elsewhere and ending up in Vermont. And one of the things that I saw an article in the Boston Globe, and I thought it would be proactive if we had a discussion about our preparation to deal with the meth problem that is already here in some areas, but promises to be coming sooner rather than later, unfortunately. Um, I think um, I would say my own meth skip people using meth in terms of violent behavior scare me more than mm -hmm. any other group of drug abusers. Um, and uh, so when I saw this article about it moving into Massachusetts, uh, living on the mass border. Um, we're not immune to that. We have roads that lead from Massachusetts into Vermont. Um, we don't have a wall yet. Um, we don't have any funding for the wall. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to have a discussion here about this problem and uh, what we're doing to be prepared for it. So I appreciate Kelly Dockery from the Department of Health as well as uh, uh, Lieutenant Randall from the State Drug Task Force. If you want to join us together and yeah. sure. meet yeah. up yeah. and uh, have a, you know, it's just a, I don't know whether you are prepared, whether you thought about this, mm -hmm. or, so it's just an idea to get, get some update to this committee where we're at. Can so. I just ask a clarifying question on math? How different is that from bath salts? It's a different, um, it's a different drug. It's okay. a different um, formulation. Because we're seeing a lot of bath salts too in southern Vermont. I don't know if you are in Bennington, but we are along the I-91 mm -hmm. corridor. So that's why I was kind of I don't know. I on that. I was specifically looking at the Globe article. Yeah. That started out with a headline treatment system feared ill prepared to deal with stimulant addiction issues. So I can start, or Lieutenant, if I don't know. Okay. So the Department of Health is uh, very aware of the increase in stimulant use. It's something that um, is showing in our data when we look at um, the National Survey on Drug Youth and Health drug use and health, and also the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, meth continues to be pretty, meth use continues to be pretty low in Vermont. Um, that isn't to say that we're not aware that of the potential for it to reach us. Um, but it is um, definitely um, not the primary stimulant that we're seeing. So, but the Department of Health has been working on a stimulant plan, um, specifically, Senator, to um, look at the treatment system as well as prevention and, um, and what we're doing in the community to help address the rise in stimulants. Uh, just to set the stage around what stimulants we are seeing, um, stimulant prescriptions have actually been on the rise in Vermont uh, dramatically, and we're actually one of the top three states in the country for prescriptions of Ritalin, uh, which is a, a 
a common stimulant that's prescribed for treating um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, it also has the potential for abuse, as do other uh, prescription stimulants. So we do know that prescription stimulant um, misuse um, is prevalent among adults. Uh, we're not seeing that as much in children, but we do see a very high rate of actual prescriptions given to children. When you, when you say we're number three, is that per capita, I hope? Um, it's, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and we're also, we are seeing an increase across the board with stimulants in terms of visits to hospitals, although we're not seeing an increase in uh, overdose fatalities from stimulants, we are seeing an increase in emergency department visits for stimulants. Um, most of um, stimulant-related fatalities that we have seen, about 80% also involve opioids. So we are seeing a lot of stimulant use among people who are using other stimulants. Uh, so, um, just to, um, the other area of concern is that our young adult, 18 to 25 year old population, uh, our cocaine use among that population is the highest in the country. So, um, definitely some red flags that we're seeing around stimulants. And uh, we are seeing more people seeking treatment in our treatment system for stimulant use. Um, so that's good. But we are um, doing some things uh, to prepare for this. Uh, back in January, we conducted a literature review to look at um, different treatment methods and what are the most effective treatments for stimulant misuse. Um, and so that was completed back in January. And we're doing a needs assessment of our preferred provider system of treatment to look at what practices they currently use in terms of treating stimulants, are they in line with evidence-based practice, and what technical assistance and training needs do they have around treating stimulant use disorder so that we can um, be prepared, prepared to provide that technical assistance and training. And we actually already have delivered some training to our provider network, specifically on um, motivational interviewing, um, there was a medication-assisted treatment learning collaborative that specifically addressed polysubstance use. So looking at those providers who are providing opioid medication-assisted treatment and how prepared they are to also address stimulants when they're seeing people who are struggling with opioids. And we've requested some technical assistance from the Addictions Technology Transfer Center, which is a a training center that we access um, around substance use issues. So we're going to be working with them um, uh, pretty soon on, there's a, there's a method of treatment called con contingency management that is the most promising practice for. What's, I'm sorry. It's called, it's called contingency management contingency. and it's really like an incentive based treatment program. And so we've requested some technical assistance from the Addictions uh, Technology Transfer Center on developing some training and some other things for our provider network. As far as um, outreach to the community, we've added a stimulant page to the Department of Health website that has a lot of resources for community members, for providers, and other interested, maybe people who are suffering with uh, stimulant misuse so that they can um, get as much information as possible. We um, also got some materials that um, that are on the Vermont Addiction Alcohol and Drug Information Center site so we've provided information to them because that's often where providers go to look for um, information and we also updated, you may recall back, I believe it was in the early 2000s when MET really sort of hit the scene and we worked with public safety at the time to develop materials around um, how to, like what are the signs that there might be meth manufacturing happening in your community. So we reviewed and um, sort of updated those materials and put those out on our website and um, put some direct links to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They've got some really great materials on meth and other types of stimulants. 
And then we're also doing <coughs> some um, work with children and youth. So we're later this fall, we're going to be doing a briefing with school nurses and with the substance uh, abuse folks that we fund in schools to specifically do some education with students and faculty and staff around stimulants and what to look for. And we just very recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, did a series of focus groups with young adults specifically on substance use. What they're seeing, what their own experiences are, and actually next week we'll be getting the report from the, um, from the agency that conducted those focus groups. And those focus groups will inform the social marketing strategy. And are you seeing the same in the state police? Yeah, um, I will say, forces? yeah, methamphetamine <laughs> has been here, crystal meth has actually been here uh, for quite some time. We haven't seen the influx that um, our counterparts across the country are telling us that we're going to see. Uh, twice a year, I go to, with our captain, we go to a um, a conference and we network with other state agencies and drug enforcement agencies and they see the trends and as we know we see it across the country they start in the west and they can go to the east and um, they're seeing it's a state it's a national epidemic right now that they're having and I'm fortunate enough to say that we have the partnership with Department of Health we're already on it from the opiate standpoint so we have that piece in place um, we are monitoring this, and uh, but we are seeing an increase. Um, we are also seeing an increase in um, crack cocaine as well. So uh, we do know that it's here. We're aware of it. We're monitoring it, and um, and like everybody has told us in the past, that if it's something that hits our state, if we thought we had a problem with opiates, when crystal methamphetamine hits in those type of numbers, then we're going to have a problem. I was all, and I don't want to, we had press releases the other day, we discussed that, but every bus that I see, it appears to be the vast majority are opiate and um, heroin, fentanyl, et cetera. Very rarely do I see some bus for methamphetamine or even producing. And I've heard that Franklin County has a high incident of methamphetamine and um, I understand that the like West Virginia and Kentucky and parts of Ohio have particularly high uh, rates in terms of meth and cocaine and stimulants and what I what, what scares me that we're woefully inadequate with all the things we've done we still are have places in the state that aren't fully equipped to deal with the opiate crisis, mm -hmm. my district being one of them. Mm -hmm. And if we're that far behind on that, where are we? And I don't know how you, it's difficult to treat mm -hmm. um, people who are using cocaine and methamphetamine. <laughs> um, there's no, you know, suboxone or methadone. Um, and there's also concern around the perceived risk um, that, that people don't feel that stimulants like cocaine are as dangerous or risky. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the okay. stimulants that you're finding are um, a result of prescription? I have about three questions. A result of prescription or are they homemade? The methane, the crystal meth? Or? So crystal meth is we're actually seeing in Vermont right now is something that's coming in from Mexico and out west as well. So it's being shipped in. Crystal meth is different than what we were dealing with several years ago with the, what we call the one pot method where they're manufacturing it. Um, so what we need to be prepared for and aware of is if the supply and demand, the supply goes down, the demand is up with that, then the one-pot methods are going to come back to the state. So right now we do see a decrease in the one-pot method, but we're starting to see the increase in the crystal meth. The crystal meth basically looks like shard glass. It looks like a clear glass. So when people see it, it looks kind of like a pure type of a product. And again, it's when they try it for the first time, it gives them that sensation that 
it's a, a, a feeling that they're just like the opiate. It's a different type of feeling, but it's um, more, it grabs onto them like, they, like the opiate. <coughs> so then the other, uh, a couple other questions. Um, the uh, prescription drug deal detailing program mm -hmm. that exists is, has been quite effective, yes. outcome-based. And so are, is, is there a connection between you and that organization, that committee? And I know we meet in the coming up yes, October, I, I think, but. I will actually be there. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. So is this something that you'll bring to the primary care folks? Yes. To, mm -hmm. Can you just talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I actually oversee that grant that the Department of Health has with AHEC um, and the academic detailing. So this is very much on my radar. Um, for them, and I'll be attending that meeting coming up. So, and then link that with the $9.7 million that's come in in terms of a prevention with opiates, right. opioids. Is this, can that also be used to identify programs that work for prevention, uh, intervention? Yeah, uh, I'm thinking of, of preventing the influx of crystal meth as much right. as anything else. So the, the recent CDC grant that we just got that was announced last week, um, it is opioid focused, but one thing is that a lot of the preventive measures that we use for opioids and for other, you know, are effective for other substances. So. A big focus of that grant um, is looking at data specific around opioids and around um, opioid overdose fatalities, which like I mentioned, many of which also involve other substances. So we should be able to get you know, more data around how prevalent stimulants are in those overdoses. And then the prevention strategies that we will be using in that grant will also address other substances. So. Um, there, as you know, there's been a lot of money coming into the state for opioids, and um, we're able to be true to the funding source and address opioids while also recognizing that you know other substances are also an issue and often um, used together. Yeah. One last question, and it deals with the um, prescribing of Ritalin for kids, and we we know that's always been a point of contention, but and may lead to involvement in the judicial system later in life. So are there, is there any data on Ritalin prescription for and outcomes for kids? I'm very always yeah. very concerned about um, drugging children. Right. That's a great question. I don't have that information off the top of my head, but I can certainly um, look into that and bring it back. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so history um, has proven that we have drug trends where there's the hottest drug on the, out there on the market that everybody wants to try, everybody is looking to get their hands on. Crystal meth is um, being produced and cheaper and is easier to get now than it was several years ago. Um, just like when fentanyl hit the market, and it was cheaper, it was easier to get, and it's coming into our country. And they're actually, um, that's the history in itself, I guess I can say that. You know, years ago, we did have an opiate heroin problem, then it moved to crack cocaine, and then it moves back to heroin, and now we've got the crystal meth um, that is coming. It's just the supply is there, and people are trying it, and then they bring it in, and then they start distributing it to the same as what you would with heroin. Can I just it's, piggyback on that for a second? Back when, before the opiate crisis was full blown, we took steps in Vermont to deal with crystal meth yeah. because we knew that was coming. And we, mm -hmm. we did some changes in the law mm -hmm. regarding Sudafed and all that sort of stuff for the, you know, the one pot type thing. The state police also had a lot of training and did a lot of work. I know Reg Trey was involved with the, um, the, you know, what happens if you have a crystal meth factory, in, or not crystal meth, meth factory in your, neighborhood and how you deal with that. You know, we took a lot of steps. I just don't, 
are we taking those steps this time? That's like, because I think that helped us to avoid what was coming from West Virginia. I keep picking on West Virginia, but you know, I don't know anybody from there. So. And this is a little bit different. So uh, what we were dealing with then is actually the one pot method where they could actually manufacture it themselves. Right. This is more, this is actually produced and it's the kind of, it's coming so it, in it's both the, already. Both the prescribers as well as the um, illegal drug trade? For? Well, people are prescribing a lot of stimulants, stimulants. Right. 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 Ritalin, et cetera. Yes. Right. And then you've got the Mexican cocktails and others bringing mm -hmm. in them. Right. Yeah, so I think, you know, with that, with it being available and it's coming into our state, I do feel that education for adults and our youth is really something that we need to focus on um, right off and get the message back out there. And again, you know, some of the systems that we do have in place, which the one pot methods that we've uh, talked about in the past that we've had a um, that would be helpful too to keep an eye on that as far as if the, like I said, the supply goes down but the demand is still there, they'll fall back to that method. So definitely we are monitoring it. We are watching it very closely with our partners, um, with our federal partners as well. So, uh, but uh, it is here in our state. Is there a perception that it is less dangerous than opioids? Is it, are, are people thinking, huh, opioids are a real issue, so I'm going to do this other drug? Yeah, I think at times people get into that, but once you're, you try it the one time or you're, um, and you use it, then they're gonna continue to use it, and it's more so that it's, a, it's available. And I can't pinpoint yeah. it. I don't know if you can actually I say think, that. Yeah, I think for cocaine, there's a perception that it is less dangerous than opioids, but um, I but I don't think for I don't know for crystal meth. Um, and and it, crystal meth is highly highly addictive. It was great to ask. So yeah. so equally or more addictive than opioids. I, I I mean I don't know the science on the top of my head, but I think that. Um, Probably it's equally, if okay. not more so. Yeah. Is it being injected or is it being it almost, can be, it uh, can be injected. I know it, it can, can be, be but snorted, what's the basic be, use being yeah. right now? There are a lot of different ways that you can use it. You can inject it, you can snort it, you can uh, smoke it. Is you there a particular population group? Kids, adults? Are it already? Well, our use here in Vermont is is low, so right now. So um, so it's difficult to say. I mean, I do have a little bit of data here that says that um, that let me pull it out here. That um, the in the twelve year old plus population up to eighteen, our use thankfully, is much lower than the rest of the United States. In our 18 to 25 year old population, it's slightly higher than the US, but not statistically significantly so. And it's, and that's, you know, like one and a quarter percent of the population. So for the lieutenant, so uh, Senator Sears referred to the uh, uh, one pot method when that became popular, the training that BSB gave, gave to uh, first responders I was involved in some of that and went in another life. Uh, actually, I went to two or three different incidents that were one five method, either burned building down or people were ill or, or whatever. I'm wondering, uh, you say that that seems to have dropped off, but has it really dropped off or people that are cooking are doing a better job and being able to uh, do with that safer? and have a, a good market for it, or is it just, just been market driven and that crystal meth is easier to get than it is to take the risk of, uh, uh, of cooking at home? Yeah, I think um, definitely the systems that we have in place, the blocking systems through the pharmacies, where they actually block people, that has been effective. Where people feel like now that's not as easy to get the precursors, where before it was, so, it was easy to go into the hardware store, into the drugstore, they could have the whole lab 
within 10 minutes. Now, with this new system in place, that has blocked. And they, we do have um, numbers through our intelligence center that actually indicates how many blocks that system has um, and if someone has gone over their limit. So for what we're seeing in the drug task force and um, through our investigations, we are not seeing the blood clot methods. Not to say that there aren't any out there because there are always people out there who are doing things a little bit better, able to um, hide or do stuff and, and not get caught. But from what we're seeing in our friends and in the task force itself, that we are not seeing an increase in those, and we have seen a, de a decrease in so that. So you're using the one pot method kind of as a, as a barometer to gauge what's happening with crystal meth? No, crystal meth uh, is really totally different. They, it's brought in just like uh, an opium would be, just like crack cocaine. So they're um, having it, a lot of it's already prepackaged, or they'll get a bulk of it, they'll package it up and distribute it. That's a lot easier for someone to go on the street and just get the crystal meth than it is to actually manufacture. So they are two different um, methods of meth amphetamine. One is the crystal meth, and then the other is what we call, what we've been talking about, the one pot meth. Senator, I mean representative. I keep calling mm -hmm. you senator. Yeah. I'm a rep. <laughs> <laughs> the dean. Uh, the dean, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about all the resources that we have throughout the state and as, as the state. What about the folks who are really, the boots on the ground, the folks who are really coming into contact with this? Mm -hmm. And I'm referring to our local police departments our local EMTs, our hospitals, our ambulance, all of that, they're the ones who are seeing this firsthand. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to what tools we can put in place to help them because that's where either the person who is using can keep reusing or you can start breaking the cycle, but also your local folks EMTs and police departments, they get burned out because they're called out to the same folks over and over and over. So how do we break that cycle at the local level? What tools can we do at the local level? One thing that um, is part of the CDC grant that was just announced last week is training with uh, first responders, EMTs, around um, motivational interviewing and compassion because we've heard from first responders that exact mm -hmm. issue of feeling very frustrated and um, and frankly not feeling very compassionate when they've returned to the same mm -hmm. house time and time again. So we're doing some training with them. Also, we're, um, I mean, this, is, this piece is a little bit opioid specific, but because there is so much poly substance use, ideally, you know, it would address this issue as well, is, um, getting people rapid access to medication-assisted treatment. So when they come into contact with emergency responders, let's say if there's an overdose, we know that 95% of the, of the folks who um, have an EMT response due to an opioid overdose end up going to the emergency department. And we are um, rapidly having medication-assisted treatment available immediately at emergency departments across the state. And part of that process is doing an assessment in terms of what is somebody's actual full substance use picture. So even though it's sort of under the guise of opioids, they can connect people to treatment that would address all of the substances that, um, that people might be using. So what if a person didn't? Uh denies going, what if a person says, no, I'm not going to the emergency room? That's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. People are, are saying they're refusing to go to the emergency mm -hmm. room after Narcan has been administered mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. What's the process then? Those folks need to get hooked in either to a designated agency, a recovery center, and then you get into the HIPAA issue with the EMTs. Is there any work being done on that? Well, our EMTs are certainly providing information about treatment resources, and we have some um, kits that we've put together that in addition to providing naloxone 
for the person to have after the EMTs leave. It also has information about treatment resources and recovery supports. You know, it's trying to meet people where they are, and unfortunately, even with a potential overdose or an EMT response, some folks are just not ready to access yeah. those resources. So and Bennington, the local turning point club, has begun mm -hmm. to as much as possible mm -hmm. go to these uh, overdose sites and try to say, well, if you don't want to go to the hospital, at least talk to us. And right, right. Try to help offer what's available. But yeah. uh, there's a challenge. It's a big, uh, if but, we're having that challenge with opioids, what's right. going to happen with men? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the treatment is different. And I, just, I don't know if the treatment world is ready for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that, I mean, that was the reason for putting it on the agenda, mm -hmm. was to try to highlight that we have opportunities to try to avoid some of these major mm -hmm. problems that other states are dealing with right now. And mm -hmm. what are we doing? What do we need to be doing? And that's why we're doing the needs assessment of our treatment network to find out what are they doing now in terms of stimulant treatment and what training and, and technical support do they feel like they need in order to be able to address stimulants. It seems like, you know. Well, I mean, the data that you have, that you've given us is pretty clear so that there's some identified places mm -hmm. and, and um, drugs mm -hmm. that can be targeted. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew how to operate and get there. I brought paper yes. copies. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> good. Yeah, taking the corrections language. <laughs> who? who uh, I do. I do. Again? So, I do. I'm sorry. We're, sorry. we're house members. I know. <laughs> I do. Uh, Kelly, I, I, hear, I heard you say uh, first responder burnout, first responder attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, first responder. Mm -hmm. You can't get to that fast enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. And with enough support right now. Yep. Uh, I hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. oh, we're going back there again. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, oh, we're going to the same person again. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's serious. It's, it has potential for uh, PSTD, among, uh, as you well know, among first responders. Mm -hmm. How can you elevate that? Response to first responders, how can you elevate that from yeah. the top of the pipe? Well, because first responders, as you know, are hard to find today, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the volunteer mm -hmm. And they're just, frankly, burning out at a yeah. very, very high rate uh, due to some of these uh, repeat uh, mm -hmm. yeah. repeat users, repeat calls that they get. Mm -hmm. how, how do you elevate that? How do you well, get that support for them? Yeah, well, luckily, yeah. this. The grant that I spoke about from the CDC, just we just got the award as of September 1st. So the, that work will, is starting now. So um, it's definitely a priority in that work plan with that grant. And we got you know $9.5 million over three years um, and to do a host of things, but that is definitely a priority in our work plan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead. How much of this is, I've got my corrections hat on, but how much of this is going to start putting pressure on our Department of Corrections? Because where, if, where are the folks going to go? Mm -hmm. There's going to end up being some behavior that the public says, you've got to arrest them. Mm -hmm. And what pressure is that going to put into our other systems? Is that being looked at? Because corrections doesn't go out there and recruit people to come to them. <laughs> people come to them through other systems. It's not DOC that brings them in. So what can we do at the front end here? Because if we don't do anything, health-wise, some of this is not criminal behavior driven. It is health driven, addiction. If we don't address that, they're going to end up in corrections. Well, I think for the Department of Health, it is the focus on the treatment system and, and helping us bolster that treatment system so that we can get people into treatment and successfully treated. But we got law enforcement. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, and we also I, put I, in place the 
uh, addiction, the uh, prevention chief, right. and the uh, and the executive branch. So if Bennington, if Bennington County is the second highest in the state behind Wyndham County, and Wyndham County is the highest in the state, and they both have one thing in common, and they're on the mass border. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, at least for Bennington, has in common, and maybe not true in Wyndham. Treatment is already woefully inadequate in Bennington County for opiate abuse. I, mean, we, we I talked with you about that. Um, and uh, we're trying to figure out why. I and mean, obviously one of the reasons is that when the spoke and hub system came into place, Bennington was supposed to be a spoke of Rutland, but Rutland quickly filled every slot for methadone treatment from Rutland residents, and Bennington couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. So if we're already the highest in this, the, the two southern counties are the highest in the state, what are we doing in those two counties to prevent, number one, the spread to the rest of the state, but number two, to make sure that we're treating and um, where it is the law enforcement response needed to deal with this problem? Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I, I wasn't aware of how much the, what the per capita in Bennington County was mm -hmm. um, of uh, stimulant prescriptions. Now, that's prescriptions. That's mm -hmm. something we can control. Has anybody talked to the Southwest Vermont Medical Center about the number of prescriptions in Bennington County? Not to my knowledge, but I. That, I mean, that's sad. I mean, mm -hmm. we we are. I mean, we can at least have some influence on prescription writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we certainly have the data. And I, uh, I don't ever, you know, we had a meeting, and there was a lot of discussion about getting to a treatment hub in Bennington County, and the opiate crisis. And I don't remember anybody bringing up that mm -hmm. we had the second highest rate right yeah. of prescriptions. Well, this um, data brief that you have in front of you is literally hot off the presses as of last week. So. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, we actually have a meeting October 4th with so many of the legislators of the opiate response group. Mm -hmm. I'm going to certainly bring this up. Um, and you may be aware that the CDC grant that I keep bringing up, um, yep. a lot of the efforts in that grant are targeted toward Rutland, Bennington, Rutland, and Windsor because they are the counties that are the most impacted. And yet, let's, I look at the Stimulant-related diagnosis in Wyndham County and Rutland County are way up there. And we're way down. And how did we get way down? I don't know what happened there. We, there might be a mistake in the analysis, but yeah, you should be worried. I, well, I am. I am. And what I'm worried about, and I appreciate the fact that the focus is on treatment, but as Representative Cooper asked before, what's causing this and what are we going to do in, to intervene so that thankfully right now the, um, the epidemic is low in Vermont, but what will we do to keep it from being exacerbated? Well, we do have the new Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council that you know, was formed in the last session. And that council, which replaces the Opioid Coordination Council, the Tobacco Evaluation Review Board, and the Vermont Alcohol and Drug Abuse Council, um, is a cross-substance prevention-focused council. And we are still awaiting word of our preven chief prevention officer that um, will be appointed by the governor's office. But the health department, um, Commissioner Levine and a, and a community prevention professional, Melanie Sheehan from Mount Scutney, um, are the co-chairs of the new council. And the executive committee is meeting um, next week to actually start appointing the rest of the council so that we can start our meetings in October. And the charge of that council is really to look at uh, what prevention efforts are happening across substances across the state so we'll be doing an inventory as well as um, looking at evaluation metrics for all of those prevention efforts to identify you know, what are really um, the effective things that are already happening. And then the council will make recommendations as far as how to you know, bolster our prevention infrastructure across the state. And um, 
So, uh, and any substances of uh, risk of misuse um, in the legislation, as you may be aware, it says that any taxes on those substances, um, a significant portion thereof would be directed to prevention efforts. So we are um, very focused on prevention. That's um, part of the Department of Health's mission. I want to make sure we're not shooting the messenger here, because uh, yeah. I really do appreciate getting this information. Yeah. And, uh, one more questions. Uh, Representative Emmons. So I'm on the page, is it second, third page? Second page, yeah. That deals with stimulant use among high schoolers. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this ties into the previous questions, um, but if you look at that, the use has decreased yeah. since 2009 to mm -hmm. 2017, but when we talk about the 18 to 25 year olds, they've increased. Mm -hmm. So what's happening between that high school year mm -hmm. and becoming an adult on the ground? What's happening? Because if it's decreased while they've been in high school, something triggered mm -hmm. that usage. And I'm also wondering, do you have the breakdown here of the different schools or school districts in terms of what they're seeing? Because some districts may be decreasing. Right. This is an average right. of the whole state, but in some parts of the state, there may be an increase. Right. That data comes from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, mm -hmm. and I believe that we have that by it supervisory should be right. Did, yeah. um, I'd, like to, I'd like to see that because that may give some indications for some of our counties that are showing an increase. Um, and I'd also like to know, too, about dropout rates. Um, Shayla just reminded me that um, you can look at school or supervisory level, mm -hmm. supervisory union level YRBS data on mm -hmm. our website. Okay. But that, to me, is telling if it's been decreasing in high schoolers, but it's starting mm -hmm. to increase. Is it starting to increase as well in high school? What's happening from the mm -hmm. time that they're 15, 16, 17 year old to 18? They're more engaged. Well, just to plug in one piece, vaping. Vaping the is big. Has so there are lots of some stimulants yeah. available. By well, we, we also, I think, if we focus on one drug, we forget, I mean, you know, I, I always think of the parent who said, thank God their kid was using booze, <laughs> not some other drug. I think uh, when you look at the decrease in high school, we also can't ignore the drug culture that exists once you get to college. Mm -hmm. And I know I see a lot of that at UVM of kids who say, you know, you see cocaine use really prevalent in parties and on campuses and so if somebody wasn't using it in high school and they get to college and they make friends and they go to parties and everybody's using it then they're more inclined to maybe try it for the first time or go back and they think like you said this isn't as harmful as something else this is just a party drug everybody's doing it, it can't hurt me that also might be a little bit of a response to that discrepancy between high school and then when you get to 18 to 25. But I'd also like to dig deeper into the 18 to 25 mm -hmm. to find out how many of them are in college and how many are not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they can't get absorbed in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Other questions? This has been extremely helpful. Um, and I'm glad that this was hot off the presses. I, you know, I think it should be attributed to all of the hospitals, so they're aware at least of what's going on in their, their area. Lieutenant, thank you so much for the work yeah, that you all do. And, uh, I appreciate it. I'm glad you guys brought this um, to the table. I do think that's important. And I was thinking one more thing about hospitals. I think it's been good to kind of work out some things with the opiate and the overdose, making sure we're aware and when someone's overdosing and that and through the system. And I think this is something that we also need to look at and focus on a little bit more. Um, and it is good not to just say we have the opiate crisis going on, but now we have these other underlying drugs over here that are going to take over. So it's good that we're getting a start on it now. And um, I think it's very helpful. I, I appreciate it. I don't think there's any secret. I mean, that substance abuse problem. Yes. Forever and on mm -hmm. and throughout this nation, and, and it's nothing new. But 
the drug of choice seems to shift. It changes, it definitely. It changes. Yeah. And unfortunately, I, I, uh, amphetamine and cocaine are certainly just as dangerous, if not more so than opioids. We, one last thing, we um, don't have, the results are starting to come in from a study that um, that we were doing in collaboration with the University of Vermont, it's called CASE, and it's uh, um, attitudes and behaviors among um, middle schoolers and on um, through young adults, um, their attitudes and behaviors around substance use and other things. So we'll be starting to get more information from that study soon. So and we'll be putting that out there when we Great. Thank you both very much. And good to see you. Back thank, you. thank you, thank you, Senator Sears, for That's bringing good. this to our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get back at one. Okay. Under item is challenges to the corrections population. <clears throat> we started talking a little bit about that this morning. I know that uh, I talked yesterday with Judge Grierson about his challenges. And I will start by saying one of the things that happens is that we have a lot of people who generally support reducing corrections numbers and against locking people up. But then we sometimes get down to specific people that we want locked up. And they may not fit the definition of what we put together for. For example, there's a person who's very well known in Bennington County who's been arrested on a misdemeanor charge who a number of people want locked up for violating the conditions of his release, but it's a one year misdemeanor. And so it's convenient to blame the judge for not locking him up. But Maybe because we've kind of set directions out as a state that we don't want to do that. And then we have a person, and I see that the um, Essex County State's Attorney is able to get a, somebody locked up who, for animal cruelty. Well, I don't know all the details, but um, it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum for judges and for us as policymakers when there's certain people that we, that, you know, we have the, ex, the Rutland County case where the people think a person should be dealt with. <clears throat> anyway, I, I think it's important to remember that, that we have a, a general, I think the general population is supportive of criminal justice changes, but sometimes when it comes down to specific criminals or specific crimes, we're not happy with it. So with that, um, Representative Evans stated that the Corrections Department doesn't have control over who gets locked up, but to a certain extent they do, because they do have people who are on probation, parole, um, and other statuses who they are responsible for who they can uh, make choices about. But at any rate, um, the subject is population challenges. And Mike Touchette, first on that. Okay, I'm going to, if it's okay with the committee, I'd like to have Monica Weaver and Shannon Marcou join sure. me so that if I get something wrong or I miss all the points, I'm able to pull the committee in. Uh, Mike Touchette, Commissioner of Corrections. Monica Weaver, Administrative Services Director for the Department of Corrections. Uh, Shannon Marku, Facilities Operation Manager. Yeah. Um, so before we have a couple of handouts, and we have three of us here, because as you know, nothing in corrections is simple. Uh, and we worked really hard to try and simplify kind of an explanation of population flow within, within the Department of Corrections. But I would like to start by just doing a quick follow-up to um, what Senator Sears just mentioned around, uh, you know, uh, it's really a cultural dynamic, not only from Vermont, but the United States around how crime and punishment are handled. Uh, you know, back in the 70s, the 80s, where crime really shifted that focus 
uh, what was truly about the payment, and we got further than one question that you raised, and so now there's a kind of a, a sense, perhaps, that people are still looking to occupy those beds to some degree. Uh, justice Reinvestment 1, I feel strongly that Justice Reinvestment 2 will continue to put Vermont on the map of being thoughtful and mindful about how we utilize those prison beds uh, as we go forward. That said, I think one of the challenges we have as a state is shifting that culture of just lock them up and throw away the key. Um, we can do that, but I will tell you that in the long run, it costs the taxpayers a lot, a lot more money if we're turning these people out as better prisoners and better criminals than we are better citizens. So I think, uh, again, the justice reinvestment work that we're engaged in, we're applying for some grants that help us think about how we strategically move forward in our operations and the systems that we're providing. Uh, that I think will help shape and pave the path for Vermont to continue to be on the map of uh, being uh, restorative in nature, but also uh, being smart about how we're using the correction system. So with that, I just want to uh, we'll jump into kind of the population, and Mark, if you could go in and out. Yeah. I'll you get it all on one page? So I was thinking about you, Senator Sears. The conversation that we had the last time we had it down for. It's a big so page. It's a big page. It's a big page. <laughs> well, you know, the other page we had was color coded. The other page we had was two sides. This is just one sided on so it's all on the Good. Color code. <laughs> Keep it simple. So, just as the community is aware, I am horribly, horribly colorblind. I have a black and white copy. I will not be it's talking about colors. So, if you have a question about a color, Shannon or, or Monica will be, the, be able to help us. There are some Thank you. So, this is really kind of a broad picture of. The Vermont Department of Corrections, primarily around our in-state capacity, um, and, it's, and it does touch on our current out-of-state population as well. Um, at the top, you'll, you'll see that uh, it mentions our out-of-state population. Currently, we have 276 uh, males out of state, um, and we have used the out-of-state uh, system both for-profit prisons and non-profit, such as the state of Pennsylvania, for more than 20 years at this point. The real challenge that the department has right now is finding eligible inmates who are, who are eligible to be placed in an out-of-state facility. For example, if an inmate is designated as SFI, they're not eligible to go out-of-state. If an inmate is receiving chronic care services through the Health Services Division, they're not eligible for us state. So examples of that might be dialysis, HCV treatment, uh, or any other sort of form of chronic care uh, where um, sending them out of state would not uh, lend itself to a good continuity of care for them. MAT has been a significant impediment to the department to send people out of state. We are engaged in conversations with CORSIN about administering MAT in that system to our population. There's been no commitment at this point. Uh, we have about 700 individuals in our system right now who are on MAT. And those, uh, in those 700 individuals are comprised of both sentenced and detained uh, inmates, and I don't have a breakdown of, of that population at the moment. But when we're looking at who is eligible for placement out of state, our numbers have really, really diminished. I think we have 13 currently that we can consider sending out of state. So can I just interrupt? Are detainees allowed no. to go? So that's 400, almost 400, that's 400 folks. Yes, that's 400 people immediately that cannot be sent out of state on the 17, 1700 that we have. And females, which I didn't put in this particular right. graph. So there's another 160 yeah. uh, individuals that are not eligible to go out of state. MAT is another 700 individuals that are in all over the last state. Currently, we have about uh, 30 to 40 persons enrolled in the HCV treatment, the Hep C treatment. Um, programming status uh, if, if somebody is, if they're within a period of re entry, we're, we're getting ready for them to re enter in the community. We deliver programming services prior to their re entry so that there's skills are fresh in their mind as they, as they re-enter. Uh, sex offender treatment programming is a big one. There's 60 inmates in that program currently. There is a waiting list for that program. 
uh, risk reduction program uh, is all offered here in Vermont. That's another cohort of individuals who would not send out of state uh, to receive those services. Um, so as you can see, as these things add up, we have a really very small pool of individuals who are eligible for out-of-state placement, and that puts additional pressures on our system, uh, keeping it uh, as safe and as secure as possible. Uh, at any given time, we have about 60 sled beds or boats that are being utilized around our correctional facilities, both male and female. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, it is simply a hard plastic. Uh, it looks like a toboggan, quite frankly, uh, that gets, uh, we put a mattress on top of it, it's elevated four inches off the ground, and, and uh, the person will sleep on that as opposed to a bunk uh, because we don't have the beds. Uh, I know we, uh, the group that toured Southern State uh, this past Wednesday got an opportunity to see what that looks like. The quarters are incredibly cramped. Um, I loathe the fact of using these sled beds. Uh, having to sleep next to a commode is not, in my opinion, a humane way of incarcerating individuals. I loathe sending inmates out of state because, quite frankly, we know that connections with their family and friends is important not only for the short term, but also for the long term. Um, so we have a lot of challenges in respects to not only managing our in-state population beds, but also effectively using our out-of-state beds. We currently are budgeted this year um, for 220, 225 inmates out-of-state. We're at 276 inmates out-of-state. This morning, as of this morning, we have 76 more males that we do beds in the state. Can you clarify 76 more males than you have beds? Is general that population beds. general population beds? Okay. It doesn't include the sled beds. Oh, well, no. uh, many of those people are living in the sled beds. They're in sled beds. Can I? Are you ready for questions or do you sure, want to take out questions anytime? All right. My first question is why only 15 people on home detention? That's a great question. In fact, the Defender and General. I, we I, have the Defender General here. We have the judge here. We have the prosecutor uh, here. Actually, we have two prosecutors here and others. So that that's, to me, um, a way underutilized program. We had more people in that in Bennington and Wind Windham County than the sheriff was operating in. One point of note, Senator, is that this report was compiled on August 28th as noted in months. Okay. Right? Some of these numbers, everything here is fluid. Oh, no, I understand that. But, so we have 14 people but I, When we're having these kind of population, and I, I know the judge and the prosecutors and the defender general are on scheduled to be on shortly, and maybe they can answer the question. Might as well. Yeah, some time to that that but um, work camp eligibility continues to decline. What could we do to get more people there? And another question that I have is I been talking with people at 208. I got to get my Depot Street number, street number right. 208, I think, has five people and eight beds available for apartments. Are we not? So, I mean, they're in small numbers, but they add up. They add up. And so, when you're talking about that, so it seems like those are some opportunities that are immediate. So, um, I can't speak specifically to 208 Depot and, and what's happening there as a population go. What is important for this committee to know, though, is that just even uh, two or three years ago, uh, Vermont had a population of past minimum eligible for release inmates sitting around 300 to 400 individuals. As of this morning, we're down to 138. Um, I think that's a good demonstration of some tremendous efforts on the part of the staff and the Department of Corrections to work aggressively and robustly with population on, on good reentry planning. Clearly, there's more room to be had and work to be done uh, to bring that number further down, but that's a pretty significant drop over a couple of years period of time. Um, I don't have a good answer in regards to the home detention. Um, that would be helpful that perhaps uh, Defender General prosecutors or uh, Judge Pearson might have some further insight beyond what, what we have. Okay. 
do you have an average length of time for detainees? Okay. Huh. Five to seven days. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of people who cycle in and out five to seven days, and I think that I, I have um, our operating engineer. Most of them are going to be gone within 30 days, but then there's another core group of people who um, are the group that have been charged with more serious crimes and held without bail, and they're sometimes held for a significantly longer period of time. Uh, be mindful of the time. I want to hit some of the other highlights here on this document here. Uh, the housing needs versus capacity is just a simple visual of what we have for capacity in state uh, and what, what we actually have, both in state and out of state. Uh, currently at Chittenden, we have six free general population beds. Um, numbers have been pretty stable with the female population. They tend to ebb and flow like everything else does, but they're generally within you know, plus, or five, plus or minus five people at any given time. Uh, I think it is important to note um, that the, uh, the ACA standards for prisons is a 10% uh, vacancy rate. Uh, one of the reasons why Vermont has never subscribed or been accredited by ACA is because of the limitations in our facilities to support that accreditation. And many of the other standards, we, we in fact, our auditing standards are built around the ACA standards, we will not be accredited because of our current housing situation which is why we've never uh, subscribed to or petitioned to be accredited by this uh, organization. Um, our bed cap, cap um, and there's another visual that might be helpful at some point in the future to kind of describe. Um, every unit in every facility has actual beds that are built into the building to be occupied by an individual. So we look at that hard cap as being, that's what we know we actually have. That's what we should be operating with. And when we start to add the sled beds or we have a, you know, a large cohort of individuals uh, who are in a booking cell or in a restricted housing unit or an infirmary or some other specialized unit, we have to consider that all those people at some point will need a general population bed. We can't keep somebody in a segregation unit just because we have no beds. We can't do that. All of those people cycle back to general population, and this is kind of what this demonstrates, is we have an actual hard number of general population beds, and so beyond just the scope of people that are currently occupying it are all those other people who, at some point, our goal is to have them in the general population unit. Well, <clears throat> two things stand out. One, we have a work camp in St. Johnsbury that's underutilized, and I mentioned already the apartment, but the beds at 208 and some other programs probably around the state that aren't being used. And what can we do by working with those folks um, who are community providers to increase that population? What can we do with St. Johnsbury to change the designation or move the work camp, if necessary, to some other location? Yeah. Well, um, okay. so that, that you take a wider variety. And then the other question would be the federal detainees. Yeah. A uh, couple of, uh, go back to the work camp. Um, I think it's a good thing that those numbers have diminished. Uh, and I think it ties directly back to Justice Reinvestment 1, where lower level offenders are being circulated through diversion programs, community justice centers, reparative boards. That's a good thing. Um, uh, it is my preference and probably the preference of this committee that we not go back to having lower level, lower risk offenders cycling back into a correctional system to be, only to be eligible for a work camp program. We're currently about 50% um, filled at the work camp, meaning we have about 25 to 30 empty beds in that facility. Adjacent to that work camp unit is another unit that uh, has been used for reentry purposes, uh, but there are some limitations on the ability to use those in terms of the agreement with the town of St. Johnsbury. Uh, specifically, if they're a sex offender, uh, in order for them to be housed in that facility, they have to have come from the Caledonia County area. Uh, so we have a bit of a gap there. We are in discussions with the town manager, Chad Whitehead, uh, to sit back down and have conversations about redefining the purpose and utilization of those uh, beds. Quite frankly, it's, uh, 
we need to do that. We cannot, this is not a good use of taxpayer dollars to have about 50 empty beds sitting idly in one facility uh, in the state. Uh, so we are actively engaged in conversations with, with the town and select board. Representative. So those 50 beds that are in one wing, the work camp, and the other 50 beds that are in the other wing, are they set up like the regular correctional facility? No. Or are they barrack style? Those are barrack styles. Are, uh, it's basically a big open room. You've got double tiered bunks sitting in the middle of the room. Uh, so it's, it is a community style living environment. It's not, everybody doesn't have their own cell or double occupancy or triple occupancy cell. They're in the common area. Uh, and for the work group people, they're either working on the grounds or they're out in the community supervised doing uh, either contracted work or working for the town of St. John's Ferry. The one popular, the uh, past minimum eligible for release population are working very closely with their caseworkers uh, on reentry planning. Um, and I think the good news here right, is we start, it's been about a year and a half since we uh, entered the new MOU with the town of St. Johnsbury. We have kept that place, we have kept the reentry unit full for a long time, but now we're down to bare bones again. So that I think it's been a, an effective use of our, not only the space, but our staff. Uh, resources and skills to get people re-entered and it's having an effect to the point where we're only able to have occupy the unit at this point. So is for DOC and for your management, do you have to be careful in terms of an offender who's ready for re-entry but would not be able to live in a barrack style or not? Does that play yeah, in or so not? There's a couple things that play in that. One is um, First of all, they have to be eligible. Part of that criteria is determining whether or not they, uh, their classification is appropriate, meaning that um, their demonstrated behavior inside the correctional facility is commensurate with the uh, lower re uh, security level of supervision that happens in that unit. Uh, a number of other obstacles are um, if somebody is not medically cleared, for example. Uh, we have quite a few inmates that are, are, uh, require a CPAP machine to be able to breathe and sleep all night. Uh, because there are no outlets by every bunk that's in the middle of this big room, they can't be they can't be housed there because they wouldn't be able to have access to the CPAP machine. Uh, so it has some real limitations in the ability to. Um, it's, it has very little flexibility, quite frankly, and that's I think that's one of the challenges we have across all of our uh, facilities is uh, not being agile enough to, to change uh, the purpose and intent of the design. Southern states a good example, Foxtrot. That's 46 beds that looks, feel, smell like segregation because they are. And we can put a, a tremendous amount of capital funds into that and it's going to look and feel like a segregation unit. Any questions of the commissioner? Or the um, 138 folks that you have passed them in but for because of the housing issue, I mean, that. That one feels like it's a solvable problem. And I appreciate that you have solved a lot of that. So yeah. kudos to you for that. But <laughs> what do we need to do to get that to zero? <laughs> I will, I will be, I'm, I'm smiling because I, at some point I've always wanted to. It, we, there are, uh, there's some of these people we want to get out pretty quickly. There's no question, right? I, they come back in, we just need to re-strategize on the re-entry plan. And again, all of these numbers are cool, but there is a cohort of individuals who have truly exhausted every possible resource, friend, family, person, housing uh, possibility in their communities. Uh, people are tired. They are no longer willing to host these individuals. And I think that's kind of where we're, we're, I'm not, we're not there yet, but we're pretty darn close. And these people that they don't have their own resources and they truly burned every possible wish. It's more than just housing, it's all the other supports that they need to be successful in reentry that they just don't have. Out I don't know what the better term is, but I think lack of available housing is a is a term it's that a term that doesn't many. really describe right. the individuals. Um, I, I think we really need to come up with a better description. When the public hears that you get 136 people that are waiting because they right. lack adequate housing or whatever the term you use, yeah, they just say, well, you know. Well, so, and I, I agree, and I understand the complexity of the problem. I wonder if one of the solutions, and you put 
excuse me, COSAs around sex offenders, should we be talking about expanding those services to another kind of difficult group of people who are not able to succeed on their own because they've burned out all of their connections in the community? So how do we build those connections in the community? And I'll just use the COSA as an example. Are there things that we are able to do in the community that will support those people so they'll be successful? Uh, so to your point, Representative, yes, we, in fact, there are cases that are not sex offenders who are going to be posted uh, for that exact very reason. Um, CJC is a limited resources as our volunteers. I mean, if we can support either of those and there's a willingness for volunteers to really support these uh, circles of accountability, then we can probably see some increases there. Um, but um, uh, we, we do utilize that right now. One of the gaps that I think that the state has, and I don't know if Tom is here or not, Tom Dalton, but he and I have had, had a discussion last week. I bet you're going to ask a question, answer the question I was going to ask. Okay. About okay. mental health. Go ahead. Oh, no, this is a oh, substance okay. abuse. <laughs> oh, uh, same thing. We have, we have a fairly robust um, set of sober houses throughout the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. They're not contracted by the, by, through us. Uh, the challenge that we have. Uh, is that when somebody has used or is in possession of a sub substance, they're removed from the house. And oftentimes, unless they have something immediately available, they come back to corrections. That's where the gap is for us in the correctional system, is if somebody has had a relapse, and, and if we're smart about understanding the impacts or the recovery routes for, for substance abuse, somebody, a relapse is, going, is likely to happen. Um, and we're not prepared to continue that treatment modality in the community beyond just a sober house. They go right back to jail, sets them back to square one, then we're back to school. So in my conversation, to be clear, and I don't know if Tom is here or not, but he's made no, no commitment about this, nor have I, but we both agree that there, is, there needs to be continuum between a sober house and prison before we just say, hey, you use or you're in possession, you go back to jail because we're not going to host you anymore. We're, we're smart about being uh, uh, addressing substance abuse uh, adequately. That's that's a gap for us. I'm going to go ahead. One okay. final question, then I want to move on to some other okay. questions. And I, I, but I don't want to I don't want to skip over work camp uh, too lightly because that's a huge success it's, story. Believe it or not, with only 50 people in it. Well, it wasn't it wasn't yeah, 200. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't that long ago. There were 200 people right. at work camp. The success is that we have those folks. We have trouble finding people eligible for the work camp because our population has changed and the way we sentence people and the way people are handled moving through corrections. So I think it's, but can you give us like one minute of eligibility requirements for work camp and, and, and have you had any thoughts on how to change those requirements so that we could bolster that population? Uh, I'm going to let Shannon. Do you have a better information about the eligibility requirements? I, I, it's not my area of responsibility. Uh, custody level is number one, so they have to be minimum custody because it's single fence coverage around the institution. Uh, for a medium custody or higher, it would have to be a double fence coverage. Uh, so we have architecturally that limits us about uh, custody levels that we can place in there. Uh, then there are certain convictions that are uh, not of violent nature. Uh, those are automatic disqualifiers for work camp placement as well. Uh, I can't uh, uh, recite all what all those are. Major but, eight convictions. Um, as, as well as, as uh, uh, criminal convictions as well. Uh, so if you have a, a, a violent charge that you're serving time on, then you're not allowed to be there either. Uh, as, as the commissioner said, their uh, institutional behavior is also considered through the use of uh, disciplinary process, uh, but that also impacts the uh, classification level as well. Um, those are the big disqual uh, disqualifiers for, for that area, other than the agreement that what the commissioner already spoke to. And to your point, Representative, um, uh, we are engaged with the town of St. John's Bury to talk about not only the North Unit, which is um, uh, in the South Unit. We, we, we need to have those discussions about how we can effectively use, utilize those beds going forward. Uh, I think they had a select board, uh, they had a select board meeting on the 9th, uh, and then they were going to look back to me, uh, and we're going to connect that. Senator Lyons has the final question. <laughs> oh, so I hope it's a quick answer. Um, 
So there are, there are a number of folks with mental health issues that end up in corrections um, when they probably should be in health care. And uh, so what is the, the I'll ask, ask a question maybe that's just very definitive. What's the timing between the time they end up in the correctional facility and uh, they receive a psych eval evaluation? Uh, so that they, they don't stay there if they don't have to be there? Uh, that's a good question. It's, it's a tough one to answer because, it, quite frankly, it can happen from before they even actually enter a correctional facility mm -hmm. all the way through the entire course of their correctional experience. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes into our custody and they're not experiencing an, uh, an acute mental health crisis and three years from now they are, um, we'll certainly get them evaluated and assessed. Uh, but uh, the courts do a pre-screening already um, before they determine what the, what the next steps are for the individual. Uh, so that, again, it could happen even before they, uh, with the courts, before they even come to us, if they even come to us, uh, all the way through their, their entire stay with us. Uh, we do have that cohort of delayed placement persons, which uh, has significantly diminished. We might see one every three months, is that fair? Uh, so we were seeing three, four, five, six of those every month. Um, uh, two years ago, we're, we're seeing very few of those anymore, which is great news. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the color chart. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful for you, Senator. It was. <laughs> well, you know, the next witness is uh, Judge Brian Grierson, who is responsible for all this. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that, Senator. <laughs> what are the challenges for the judge? So, uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, I, I wish I had answers to all of the questions you've asked. Obviously, depending on who you talk to, either we're setting bail on the wrong people or uh, shouldn't set bail, um, and depending on other folks, we're setting bail. We should be setting it on other people that we're not. So we're literally in the middle of this. Um, I, I will say that the detainee population, um, I, I get the numbers every day like many folks do. It's right where it usually is, 380, um, not including the federal detainees. Um, those numbers, um, remain fairly constant in getting ready for today's hearing. For instance, I was going back through the archives and there was a report that Judge Davenport, who position I took, uh, did for uh, probably this committee uh, in 2011. The number on the detainee population was the same at that time, 400 individuals. And in, in going through uh, my notes, my records, every time we've taken a snapshot with, with data provided by uh, the Department of Corrections, uh, there's usually anywhere from 350 to 400 detainees, and there's usually around 25 are misdemeanors. Um, all the others are fairly serious uh, felonies. Um, and of those 20, 25 or so uh, misdemeanors, usually half of them are domestic violence cases. Um, the other half are oftentimes have other charges uh, involved either probation violations or perhaps furlough violations, so the, the offense to which they're detained on uh, is really not the reason they're being detained. Um, and so th those numbers, despite everything the legislature has done, changes we've made, it used to be that uh, clerks, uh, court clerks, commonly impose overnight bail. Uh, we've removed that uh, in the last year and a half or two years, so judges are the only ones setting bail on doesn't seem to have made a significant difference in, in the number of, hasn't, but the, that detainee population remained relatively constant over the last mm -hmm. 10 years. The home mm -hmm. detention that you asked about, Senator, I would guess without knowing that if there are 15 on home detention now, there are probably the same 15 that have been on for the last few years, and <coughs> by far <coughs> the majority those individuals were individuals being held without bail, um, and the legislature changed that status so that we could no longer consider those individuals. But I'm guessing the 15 today are probably 
most of them are carryover from that. Um, I wish I had an answer as to why electronic monitoring isn't used more, um, but we can only respond to the requests that come into the court. And uh, although I haven't checked recently, my experience when we were talking about this in committee was that there were not that many requests, so it wasn't as if a lot of requests were coming in and the courts were denying them, they just weren't coming in. Senator Bruce had a question. Um, we've, in other areas, we've uh, last year looked at expanding the authority of the judge in, in various ways. You say you can only respond to requests for electronic monitoring. Is that something we should think about empowering judges to um, be able to do without a request? Well, no, I think we can, um, we can still make the suggestion. It's ultimately um, the Department of Corrections has to determine whether the, the uh, residential setting is appropriate for electronic monitoring. But it, in the final analysis, um, the, the defendant, the individual, um, may choose not to go on. Yeah, I'm just wondering because the commissioner was um, relatively at a loss for why there weren't more people using the program, and your answer is that there aren't enough requests. So I'm, I'm wondering who we should be um, looking to for increased usage of that program. I'd pass uh, to the uh, Defender General, but I think. I think it comes down to an individual. The last guy to test. <laughs> I mean, I don't have the answers as to why there are not more requests. The court can suggest them. All I'll say was weeks. when it was in the Wyndham County Sheriff's hands, there were more people in Bennington and Wyndham County on home detention than there are today. And it was just two counties. So can I ask a question of clarification? Sure. Are we talking about home detention? Or are we talking about electronic monitoring? Because they're two separate things. You may use electronic monitoring in home detention, but electronic monitoring can also be used on its own without home detention. It cannot be. It's only for home detention? Yes. There's other electronic monitoring that goes on. Well, they on. use it on probation. I mean, okay. As a condition of probation. So that's what I want to be clear about for electronic well, monitoring. When we're talking home detention mm -hmm. status, only that is a request from either the offender or I believe DOC to the court for home detention status. Right, and the court can can look at a case and in setting bail say this case may be appropriate for home detention. Um, but we can't order someone on home detention without first getting. Request. I'm talking about home detention with an electric right. monitoring. Right. The there is population. people, the detained population, there are people who can be either electronically monitored or whatever else, they're on probation, on furlough, or whatever. I don't know those statuses. That's what I want to be clear. Yeah, I'm talking about the, everybody on electronic I think we're, 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 I was referring to the detention population, yeah. not that other population. And that's what these numbers are that I was saying. It's just probably the same people that have been on for the last two years. Um, and I don't have an answer as to why it's So when you're confronted with, where one of the judges is confronted with, the community wants somebody incarcerated, but the crime doesn't fit the, that. And I think that was the you same. know, the judge gets blamed for being soft. And, we, we um, and we have to accept that. And we do. I mean, that's what happened. Should, after we, should we do a better job of explaining the Constitution and bail? Well, I think. Or what changes could be made to. I think I was saying to you yesterday, I received a letter from an individual about that situation, and uh, that's the response that I gave them. And these, these are the, the constitutional. Um, ramifications of setting bail um, and explain the steps the legislature had done uh, recently in terms of that particular case where the, there was a limit on the amount that could be set. Um, and those are the, the, the uh, rules that the, the court follows in imposing or not imposing bail in a given case. And uh, despite what I'm sure a lot of people felt was the wrong decision, I believe the judge followed the law as they are required to do 
in making the decision that was made in that case. I don't think under our current I don't framework with that. Just the they had any choice, so I believe they made the right and correct decision based on the law as it presently exists. And defend, obviously, that judge in, in making that decision. I no, no question about that. But I mean, that's one of the, when we're talking about challenges, one of the challenges is there's certain people that the public would like to see locked up that, and those same people are calling for justice reform. So it's difficult to and represent. And we, we are obviously in the middle of that debate. Right. Other questions for the judge? So you kind of, oh. I'm sorry, I was ready to, add, to get to, the next party to move on responsible. To the, yeah. Go ahead. To the detainee conversation, um, so we heard from DOC this morning saying it, there is a cohort of people who are being detained for a very long period of time, and they're probably, they definitely are probably in the category of people who committed. You know, there's public safety issues associated there. But we also hear from corrections that this other seemingly larger quote cohort of people, and yes, I understand they may be in on felony charges, but they cycle in for five to seven or three to seven days. And it's hard to understand what, what the usefulness is of putting somebody in, in jail and, and detaining them for that short period of time. I mean, what, what is changing so that it's, I'm not asking my question very well, but I'm trying to get after that population, which at some point, clearly, after a few days, people say it's okay to be on the streets again. So why are they there in the first place? Without knowing what right. exactly, which population the commissioner was talking about, and I would just suggest the committee, you really have to focus in on the population that is being discussed at any given point in time. We set, if we set bail and the person is being detained, the reason they may be getting out in five or seven days is that they have made bail. We don't control the decision at that point. I would think that the population that the commissioner is talking about that recycles five to seven days there are probably lower level offenses that individuals are making bail and then being released. We don't make a decision, you're, you're being detained today, but five days from now we're going to release you. I guess I'm, I, appre I appreciate that. So if it's a, the reason you said bail is so that they will show up for the court appearance. Risk of flight is the basis. Of yeah, that is the constitutional basis. Yes. Should we be considering that differently? I mean, because I think we're probably talking about fairly low bail amounts that... You may, you may be in some cases, in other cases, there's... Sick. I think there was yeah. some numbers I saw where there was a large, fairly large number of bail in excess of $10,000. Only more serious cases. Let me, let me try it this way. Is this an area that we, that we can gain something in terms of controlling our population. How, how, how do we dig into this effectively? What would you do to analyze that? I think it's one of the things Justice Reinvestment is looking at. Specifically at the well, bail and detainees? The detainee population. That, that's the focus, as I understand, is the Justice Reinvestment. I mean, this is what I'm saying. Focus. This yeah. issue is not one, yeah. this is no for the same issue, yeah. and so I, I don't, I wish I had an answer to it, but, yeah. um, and it may be that home detention electronic, electronic monitoring is one approach. It has not worked um, successful, or at least successfully in the sense that it's reduced the, that population. Um, there are a small number of misdemeanor offenses. Uh, so that tells me that it, it's the more serious yeah. cases. Okay. One of the items that we specifically asked okay. to I'll let go of this. It, to, to work, look, look at our detaining population that hadn't really shifted. And not, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. actually, you look at the Zaccaro Commission report, which was in the early Douglas years, 
and that still had 400 people on the desk. Right. It just that number there, is remaining. Yeah. There is such churn in the facility. No, I realize that, it's but just, just the number stays. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I would just follow up with one comment that the commissioner made about the, the idea of an individual on furlough who is in a residential setting, relapsed, and then goes back to the correctional center. Uh, recently, uh, we have been talking to them about uh, making some, uh, certain members of the, the furlough, uh, furlough population eligible for a treatment course. It may be what these individuals need um, if they're out of a, a residential setting is the monitoring that a treatment court can provide that may keep them out of the correctional center uh, and into the community. And uh, we've been talking about a, a certain population that may be eligible for that. So that may be something that we're doing on that end um, that hasn't been done. Before. Thank you, Judge. I sometimes do a very poor job of scheduling and uh, this is one of those. We've got 15 minutes left, and I still haven't heard from the Defender General or the State's Attorney, but maybe they can Thank you. take a crack at this. Well, thank you, Eric. This was <laughs> Did you come all the way up here for this? No. Sorry. Thank God. <laughs> Hi, uh, for the record, James Pepper, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs, and I brought, well, Erica was in town for, we were looking at some of the Justice Lab recommendations for the expansion of family court jurisdiction. She decided to stick around. Um, and she is the executive chair of our executive committee um, for this, all the state's attorneys, so she does have kind of a statewide perspective on our policies as well. Um, I think just, uh, Trying to jump in very quickly to some of the concerns that I've heard, I absolutely agree that there is a disconnect in the public as to the purpose for bail. And a lot of folks see what they consider dangerous people being released on $200 bail or no bail, and they wonder why. Um, and I think, um, you know, of course, bail, as you noted, is for mitigating risk of flight. So if someone's committed 12 burglaries in a row, but they show up every time for arraignment, no judge is going to impose bail ever on that, on that case. Um, also, under the Constitution, all misdemeanors shall be bailable, and very recently that was capped at $200. So you see someone who appears dangerous to the public because of the nature of the conduct, but the only charge is criminal threatening or disorderly conduct and they're released on $200 bail and you know the public kind of has this disconnect um, why is that the case so that's something that you know our state's attorneys try to help kind of convey to the victims of crimes and, and to the media the purpose the statutory purpose the constitutional purpose of bail well one of the other issues is when the person is charged with violating the conditions of the release then they're released with more conditions. <laughs> because that's subject to the two hundred dollars cap is one. Right. In that right. but I mean I don't think the general public oh well. So they didn't follow their original five restrictions. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna add seven more that's to right. it. What makes you think that they're gonna follow those new ones? So I'm extremely consistent with telling every person in the public what the purpose of bail is, how why I'm capped at $200, I ask. You know, I may get 200, but frankly, if it's not, if it's the burglary, I'm not gonna get it. Um, and then I refer them to their representatives. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. But, well, uh, but, but, just, but, but yeah. that, so it's the $200 cap. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the, the, I think one thing that I've heard discussed a lot is maybe we should change the Constitution to change the purpose of bail to look at risk to reoffend or something along those lines and not look at mitigating risk of flight solely, um, which is very similar to the well, I, I, When I talk about risk, I would think it's a danger to the public. Danger to the public, right. To and, and that would about what, if I could just interject, that would be what I would say. Would, because what we used to do with bail before the $200 cap is it was still as to risk of flight, but the court would talk about the repeated violations and, the, and different issues to impose more than $200. And now that we're capped at the $200, um, it's 
there's no way to look at those other factors like continuously re uh, violating those conditions and also the yeah it should be people that are a danger to the public not I mean it, it certainly has to do with risk of flight but I mean I am more concerned about the person that has committed a domestic assault that you know is released in the community than the person that committed a you know, the felony trespass, but they live in New York and they left. Stay in New York. I, <laughs> that's fine with me, but it's the person who lives in my community that's committing the 25 burglaries. I literally have home 25 burglaries that I couldn't get out. So, um, but I did want, Representative Cooper, you asked about the five to seven days, and, mm -hmm. and I would, it was, it was like being in school, I was dying to tell Judge Wearson, because I know once I say it, he's gonna go, that's it. So the, the five to seven days includes the hold without bail people. The hold the, the, what? The hold without bail oh, hold individuals. Without bail. And those are set for a way to the evidence hearing. And because the judge is saying, I need more information. This person is charged with a felony crime of violence. They have a record of violence. I am concerned that this person is a danger to the victim or to anyone actually. Then. They want a hearing on that. So I, I have those come up multiple times a week, even in my county. So I'm sure they're coming up. And, and those take a couple I've days. I've never heard that before. Yeah, those take Thank a couple you. days to schedule, but I know Judge Pearson yeah. probably got to go and that was it. I'm not just going to disagree. I don't think that's not at all, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, you get, you get your, you get your. I'll get my 30 seconds. You'll get 30 <laughs> seconds, man. I promise you five minutes. Um, the home detention piece, if you want us to touch on that briefly. Yeah, well, what's, why? Well, prosecutors generally aren't in the business of referring for home detention. I mean, it can be done by the courts um, on their own, you know, motion. If not motion, but suggestion. And it can be done by the defendants. And from what I'm hearing, the defendants are moving for home detention. Why that is, I don't know. I know you need to have a stable residence that has either a landline or cell phone access, which can be a barrier to some folks. Um, I know from a public, sa public safety standpoint, people being held without bail are not eligible um, for home detention. So that's half of our detainee population right there that's not eligible. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the typical response time for people being held on home detention. Um, and you know, a judge, when someone holds someone without bail, has already made a determination that the person, the weight of the evidence is great, um, and that no combination of conditions can adequately protect the public. Didn't we, cha we change that law, right? Yes. That you couldn't be on home detention if you were held without bail. Maybe that was a mistake. Well, the way the law was written, the only folks who qualified for home detention were those that were held without right. bail. Exactly. Those that did have bail and couldn't meet it did not qualify for home detention. Right. So the, because I was one of the counties with the home detention population, right. they, at what ha I can, for me it was pretty plain, and the same with the Wyndham County State Attorney. The, it went from, I had a sheriff that had a 24-hour dispatcher watching this dot of where this person was to now I have maybe an email goes to the Department of Corrections, they get it the next morning, sometimes they get it that night, but there's still this you know significant lag time. And so when we're talking about, I mean, there were people that I had on home detention that were charged with felony crimes of violence before the law, because I agreed to it. <laughs> I said, this person is fine, the victim lives in another county, as long as I know they're being watched. But that's just not the case now. It, the way it is now, it's not. So the legislature may have made a mistake when it but the pressure, took it and put it into corrections. But the, right. Well, well it always was in corrections, was no. not. What, no, it was yeah, in the Wyndham County Sheriff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, right. It was a pilot project for the yeah. Wyndham County yeah, Sheriff, the, the, the legislature, I won't say which body, um, <laughs> changed the law <laughs> and put it with corrections. And we have actually fewer people on home detention than we had when the Wyndham County Sheriff was operating. And most of them were domestic violence. 
so I might have a different opinion. Because, That's the majority. Yeah, I might have a different opinion. Because <laughs> when we had a number of people coming in, victims groups and the victim coming in and saying, you know, yeah, I live, you know, in another town or another county, and if he's being watched, you know, the little dots mm -hmm. being watched in real time, they they would support it as opposed to how it is now. Do I defend the Department of Corrections? Three? I do. The whole state? If, yes. If you permit me. That's uh, the reason we changed it. It's just the, we were paying $200,000 a year for three people. Yeah. And he wanted to go statewide, and we said, yeah, you can do that, but give us a proposal and a plan. And he, and he didn't. Well, couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Well, I think the, I think the happy medium is whoever's running it, it's just the, from our perspective, it's the response time, and that's all. And that's the issue, whoever is running it, because the law. I want to give, I want to make sure that the commissioner has a chance to respond to my comment. Uh, uh, Mike, you check for sure questions. Just two quick comments going back to the constitutional change. Not that I dis disagree with it, the notion that maybe we need to consider the risk to, to the community or, or others, but um, considering that that is likely to increase our yes. potential Yes. <laughs> I feel like you need to put that, put that out there. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Department of Corrections Home Detention Program right now uh, is not overly well utilized. We have 14 people. It has never been well utilized. Our requirements for approving, uh, as has been stated, is a cell phone line or a uh, van line, one or, one or the other, and sometimes both if, if they have those. We do have 24 hour monitoring. What we don't have is a staff person sitting at a monitor 24 hours a day. The company who provides the GPS tracking of these individuals does that 24 hour monitoring for us. So for example, if we had somebody at 1 a.m. who had removed their bracelet, we would get a notification that would prompt our staff to get out of bed, who are on call, uh, and to, re to respond to whatever was happening. So we do have that 24 hour ability. Is it going to be within 15 minutes? Nope. I, I promised Matt five minutes. Do you have any final <laughs> comments, Dr. or Eric? Um, we're working with, obviously, Justice Reinvestment to try and get a deeper dive into our detainee population, our prison populations, and look for ways to you know, not spend so much money on it. Very expensive to incarcerate people. Yeah, and I, I just have to say that it was interesting hearing the detainee population because that was my impression that it's really been pretty constant over the last many years, probably more than 10 years. So I think maybe that's telling us that that's, that's the number it's going to be. Maybe there are different ways we can we deal with it, not decrease, but. I'm hopeful that the, the Justice mm -hmm. Reinvestment too will <laughs> come up with some brilliant ideas. Matt Valerio, I promised you five minutes. Okay, that's all I need to solve it all. <laughs> I'm sure. Matt Valerio, Defender General. Um, let's, I, I think I'll just start with the thing that people are, you're talking about with the detention population. I had got wind that this question was going to come up um, and um, had spoken to the Commissioner of Corrections about it and put out a, a survey of all of the public defenders, contract and otherwise, who do the work, and um, the summary response um, is as follows. Um, changes in the bail law have resulted in people who would otherwise be held, um, uh, who, who are now being released on conditions, and so now home detention is no longer necessary. Um, so they changed the bail law to allow more people to be released, and on the other hand, uh, the legislature in the last decade has created 11 new domestic violence statutes which would require um, put people in a position where um, the state would routinely object to people being held on um, home detention. Um, the allegedly DOC has rejected residences so frequently that defenders see it as a waste of time and effort to request. Um, prosecutors routinely fight it tooth and nail um, except for in minor offenses that don't need it. These offenses are for these uh, home detention with monitoring is best suited for more serious offenses, um, but uh, prosecutors fight, fight these even harder, um, and judges tend not to impose 
home detention over the objection of the uh, state's attorneys in those serious cases when they occur. Um, and finally, and I asked the commissioner about this, uh, and the statute specifically calls for and allows the Department of Corrections to request home detention after a period of days mm -hmm. has passed and we're unaware of any of that request ever happening from the Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that one didn't, but I don't know of any. Yeah, I, we have done this. I suspect what has happened, quite frankly, not that this is that it's part of our policy, actually, that they should do this, but in reality, when our staff are getting, anybody's being considered, they feel like it's almost like a, it's a it, we have to do the paperwork, but we know what the answer is going to be, so they focus on all the priorities. I'm not defending the actions, that's our policy, is that we do make that referral. Uh, I'm just telling you about the reality of the operations. So there seems to be a bit of a disconnect about what the, what home detention with uh, electronic monitoring is supposed to be used for, and, and particularly is supposed to be used for more serious crimes uh, that are alleged that would not otherwise be available for bail. And the only ones that it seems to get granted on are the ones that are lesser um, in particular counties. And so it's very sporadic. The numbers are so small that you almost don't know what the pattern is because, because there isn't one. Um, when we look at our detention population as a whole, I think if you go back a, a number of years, and I'll, I'll go back to the 80s when I was first practicing in Vermont before the whole bail reform of the early 1990s, almost everybody was released on recognizance. They were rarely even conditions of release, not even one, two, three, uh, you know, which is, you know, don't, you gotta show up and you don't commit another crime and the like. Um, and the uh, population really hasn't changed much. Uh, if you go back to that time, then you hit the early 90s when, when uh, uh, our 7554 went into effect at 1013. That's when we started hitting the bigger detention populations. Um, and it really has to do with considerations of the types of crime um, that uh, we would hold, people are alleged to have committed, where we're holding people. Um, I remember in the early 90s, there was an individual who came into court in Rutland and Judge Hudson was sitting on the bench um, and he had not showed up for the arraignment uh, earlier in the day and he came in later and a, and a warrant had been issued for his arrest and he said that he had difficulty getting from White River to, um, to Rutland in time because he had other charges in White River. Um, the other charges in White River were that he had been charged with homicide, um, but he had been released on, uh, uh, on his own recognizance of having had no record previously. He just had difficulty getting over the mountain to get to, to Rutland so he could deal with, and I think it was like a DUI or some, something not particularly important. Um, and, and I remember, you know, Hudson kind of rolling his eyes, oh, okay, and, you know, warrant went away. Well, that, that individual ultimately um, actually ended up acquitted uh, down the road. Just, it was an odd situation, I guess. But the, the bottom line was back at that time, um, the seriousness of the crime didn't have as much to do with the way we approach bail as we do now. And in the interim, and I've said this many times, the legislature has repeatedly increased penalties, increased the numbers of crimes and types of crimes um, for which people might be held um, on bail um, and incarcerated longer term. And I just wanted, I did a little microcosm of, a, of, of research regarding one particular area. Um, the Supreme Court came out with a uh, a report, which I, I'm sure you've all seen, this is the, the 2018 um, statistical report. And on page uh, 29, it has, it indicated that between fiscal year 08 and fiscal year 18, felony domestic cases increased by 8%. Um, in, uh, and then uh, case filings in this area are 58% higher, 58% higher than they were a year, uh, 10 years before, okay? Well, we know that the crime rate in this area has not gone up, I compared it to the crime rate in the front crime report, which indicated during the same decade, 
there were only two years where the crime rate involving domestic violence went up, and they went up by small amounts, 2%. One year was 6%, and then it dropped back down. And there's been basically a steady decline during that period of time. And on the next page, on page 30, it also indicated that case filings in misdemeanor domestic violence cases had dropped from 775 to 679 uh, during the five-year five period. Well, why is this important? Because during that same decade, the legislature created this many new crimes related to domestic violence um, that range from anything from kind of subsets involving uh, stalking um, that don't involve actual contact, um, various degrees of domestic violence. Now, I'm not saying any of this is wrong, but you ask me why. And, the, and if you look at the things that you are now can be held for, when 10 years ago, those crimes didn't even exist, that's why these people, mostly domestic violence, as we hear from corrections and from the prosecutors, are being held when they didn't even have the opportunity 10 years ago because the crime didn't exist. Um, so I think, you know, if we want to look at why things are going on, we might want to look inward a little bit. About, <laughs> and, and I've said this, it wouldn't hurt to go a two-year period with no new crimes and no new penalties. There's going to be plenty of stuff out there to allow people to be charged and convicted under existing law um, going forward and uh, uh, at least allow the system uh, to simmer uh, or marinate for a period of time before we add another layer of potential liability and incarceration to what we already have on the books. Um, so, yes, that's, that's one, I'm just, that's just one area. I mean, I, I just look at domestics. Yes. I, I want to, you know, it would be interesting to go back and look at advocacy groups and their impact on legislation um, and how that contributes to this. It would also be interesting to go back and look at how things like legalization of marijuana reduced the number of people being stopped, um, even in traffic arrests, and the number of people being charged with various that crime and how that dropped precipitously, bad word, how that made a drop in the number of people arrested. So I you know I think you could and I don't disagree with you. I don't I know that I heard a lot about domestic violence in our laws. It's a nationwide attempt to try to deal with what one of the major problems in Vermont was domestic violence or is domestic violence. So I think a lot of times we, we hear from those groups and we realize there are gaps. And, um, but yeah, we, that's, it would be interesting to know, you know, what's the impact of the laws we pass? How did the bail law impact? How did the domestic violence law impact? How did the sex offender laws impact? And, and it's not all bad. I mean, having cultural and so, social and cultural awareness of of the issues, I think, is really important. Right. I, and I know you said that. But. Yeah. I want to, and I'm talking about impact on incarcerated population. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, talking about. I'm mindful that many people have to leave at three, and we've got another issue to take up. So, thank you very that. much, Matt, and I appreciate you coming. Um, There's a note. There's a little note. Pardon? No. There's a note. I didn't do it. She did. I did it. Not me. That's why I'm mm -hmm. I know. I know. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, whether you would or whatever. I have. Um, our next witness is. Um, turn the page. Thank you all very much. Um, Dr. Eaton, and I, I'm sorry. Hey, Tom, thank you very much for helping me with that, sure. doctor. If you join us. Um, this is kind of a, getting an update. I don't expect that this would be the last day we'll talk about the racial disparities uh, issue. But I thought it would be helpful to hear from a few people. Uh, and, uh,
You were suggested as the one who knows the most. Dear Lord, <laughs> I am the chair. Um, I have been certainly keeping tabs on what we've been doing during my tenure, so I can speak to that. Uh, we are, it has been, I won't say arduous at all. I think it's actually been quite pleasant. It's been a very detailed proceeding, these discussions that we have once a month for two hours um, about the criminal justice system, about the juvenile justice system. We had, I inherited a body that felt it needed a lot of transparency and a lot of organic conversation. Uh, I have been trying very hard to foster that. I think that that has come. Um, it has taken time, as I sure, certainly don't have to tell any of you. Democracy is not a very quick process. Um, but we are, at this point, uh, we have a draft of, the rep of a report, which we are statutorily required to produce every two years. Um, we have a draft of that. We are fine-tuning it. Uh, I had the honor of meeting, and I'm going to get the accent wrong, Representative Burdett. Burdett. I did it right. Oh, thank Burdett. you. Um, at uh, one of the Attorney General's recent fora that he's been hosting around the state. And in that conversation, a due date of November, which I know is a 30-day period, has um, come up. And I have relayed that to the panel. And we are intending to have a finished product for that at that time for, for you. Great. Um, overall, mm -hmm. what are some of your impressions? Of, are we making progress? Are we falling behind? I mean, I know there's been an increase reporting of hate incidents. Yes. And some crimes. And we have, you know, what happened in Bennington, we have what's happened in um, the Birdport or Bridge. Bridgeport. 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 I'm not familiar with Addison County. So. <laughs> Where we've had things at UVM, mm -hmm. um, incidents in the Northeast Kingdom. Yes. Uh, so it, and na nationally it's on the rise. And mm -hmm. what what's some of your impressions? Uh, your panel's impressions of where we're at this, in, in the state. Within the state? Yeah. I think we have not had a specific conversation about that. I have had conversations privately with different members of the panel. I think we feel, if I'm going to just sort of give a blanket assessment, there's a sense that there, there is certainly a rise statewide in, in incidents around bias, just put it that way. Um, I do think that the recommendations that the panel is coming up with will address a great number of these things. There is a particular uh, slant at the moment, and I can get help here, <laughs> um, around uh, certainly data collection being a very important thing that we need to have more of it, more generally, more specifically. Um, but in some cases, I mean, certainly the state police are noteworthy in their attempts at doing data collection. Um, but even so, there is, there's a feeling that that needs to be fine-tuned. So that's something that has come up a great deal, uh, is how to do that more generally across the criminal and juvenile justice system. But yes, there is a sense that things are not well. They are not well. I visited Woodside, and I think there was eight kids, eight or ten kids there the day that I was there. And two of them were persons of color. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, is, that, is that odd, or do we look at those numbers? Uh, it, it's certainly why, something that's that... That's the juvenile justice system. Correct. Why would, it's, why would two kids out of, say, ten, it right. might have been nine? But, but for simple math, for those who aren't, of us who aren't great at math, that's 20%. 20 percent. When we know it's a much lower population of people of color. 
The Commissioner Schatz spoke to this at our last meeting. Um, we did not have reasons for this. That didn't come up. But it is, it is a concern. Uh, it's certainly known. It's being talked about. And we are, again, the da data collection is, is key with this. He has been very clear that that's something that needs to happen more in a more in-depth fashion in the juvenile justice system. Um, I met Skyler Nash, he's a student mm -hmm. intern with, the, with this committee, but he's also active at UVM mm -hmm. on a number of issues related to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, and uh, Skyler actually is the one who asked me to put this on the agenda to try to begin the conversation. Great. So I don't know if you have questions. Um, I'd like to hear the rest of the testimony. Um, it's a good way out. Other questions from the side? Mm -hmm. I feel very good about it. If you looked at the, the, I mean, I just saw that, you know, and I know Senator Baruth was hammering me from the time he entered the building here at Montpelier about marijuana um, and the. Uh, decriminalization first and then legalization. And I'm wondering if if we see a tremendous reduction in stocks and that stops and how does that impact this whole issue? That's a great question. That's something that certainly came up when, uh, with the most recent uh, data crunching in the state police, uh, there was there was some juggling of the figures. That there was an assumption, not a complete certainty, I should say, that there had been a change, and that it may correlate to the legalization. Not certain of that yet. Otherwise, in terms of how that will affect what we're doing on the panel, I can't say at this moment. I was just going to say, um, Tim Ash, the Senate President, points to his reasoning for not want, wanting to uh, go with prime enforcement on seatbelt laws is that they're disproportionately used against people of color. Mm -hmm. I feel like the same used to be true about very small bore marijuana offenses, right. as well as uh, differentials in crack cocaine, yes. powder cocaine. So the more we move away from the criminalization of yes. voluntary things on the part of officers um, that can be invoked or not, right. um, I think we, we decrease that mm -hmm. sense of systemic bias. And this has come up. Um, I also serve as the co-chair of the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee for the state police. And this has come up time and again when the data dump happens in June and we talk about contraband. Mm -hmm. uh, there are various people who say, yeah, isn't this a little problematic, though? Um, what constitutes contraband? How much contraband? Um, that certainly is an issue that's going to come. And when, when do you invoke it? Like, you know, and that's a discretionary moment yeah. of possible implicit bias, yes. We're supposed to signal when we switch lanes. But who is cited for that, and how is it used to advance? I'm fighting for that. <laughs> I'm fighting for those signals. <laughs> I always said. <laughs> I, but I immediately thought of one of our colleagues, Senator, about motor, would, would that be true of helmet laws? <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Exactly. Uh. The two uh, Northeast thank you, Doctor. senators. When is the report due? When is it due? Yeah. Well, that's in November. November. <laughs> <laughs> November. Well, I would like to have uh, I would love a discussion a with when that comes back. And pray, perhaps we can add. I, Mark Hughes asked to testify uh, with another person. I didn't think we'd have time for four people today, so I 
told them we would take it up again, so maybe on November 13th we can. November, okay. Would that be time for the report? Grand. Good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll wait till the reports. Uh, it would be helpful to have the report before we pass the well, 13th of November. November. <laughs> Thank you kindly. <laughs> November Thank got you. shortened up. Right, yes. <laughs> David, sure. Yeah, it's good to have it. Yeah. 30 days in November. <laughs> there are only 30 days. Are there? Yes, there are. Good afternoon. David here with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, I just want to actually start by thanking Dr. Nasrezmalongo for taking on the chairmanship of this panel. It's a, obviously a very challenging subject. The panel is made up of people with divergent views and divergent responsibilities and viewpoints, and he's really done an excellent job of guiding the panel towards um, recommendations in a report. So we're grateful to him for the work that he's done. Beyond that, um, you know, I think that speaking, I don't want to speak for the panel, just a brief overview conceptually, I think of some of the things the panel's really been focusing on. Um, discretionary points, and you heard Dr. Nasrad Malongo refer to that, discretionary points in the criminal justice system and what those may or may not mean for um, the disparities that we see and that are not really a point of dispute with regard to the outcomes. Um, and what that and, and the reality that we don't always have a lot of visibility into what is happening at those discretionary points, which brings us to the question of data and data collection. And again, this is not so much me speaking for the panel, but me, uh, you know, my observations, my office's observations about some of the areas that we hope to focus on and um, that we certainly hope end up being, uh, that we will advocate for to be part of the report, although ultimately that will be the product of the full panel. Um, and that's sort of just a broad overview. I, I, I largely wanted to defer to Dr. Nasrad Malongo in terms of being a voice of the panel, but beyond that, I'm certainly happy to answer questions or anything the panel might want, or the, the committee, I should say, yeah. want to ask about. Well, have you joined the Attorney General in the, around the state? Yes, I've been. Those, how, uh, how two of them or three? Three of them so far, yeah. We had one in Winooski, one in Hartford, and one in Rutland, and we are organizing what? one in um, uh, Wyndham County, yeah, Brattleboro for October 17th. Um, what's been the general reaction to I of the groups that have uh, attended? And yeah, they've been excellent conversations. They've been challenging conversations, uh, very emotional conversations, I think, as is appropriate and expected for the topic that we're dealing with. I feel like at each um, location, there were sort of slightly different emphases that came out from the conversations that we had. And, and these panels are real, or I should say forums, are really focused on eliciting input from community members. There is some uh, education that goes on, some discussion about what services are provided by the state, but we really wanted them to be and, and at the behest of um, some of the leaders of color around the state, we really wanted them to be a time for community members to give state officials feedback on what they really see and feel around the state. That a lot of the leaders that we spoke to felt that that was an essential thing that we needed to spend time on. And I think it you know, uh, my, this is speaking from my own observations. In, in Winooski, for example, I think we heard a lot about how important it is for state officials to interface with local community organizations that we may not routinely interface with. It may be the case that folks who um, are affected by some of the bias-motivated incidents uh, and, and hate crimes are reluctant or fearful of themselves directly working with state authorities for understandable reasons. We may, as state authorities, feel like we are as sympathetic as we could possibly be, and yet that still doesn't feel safe. And so having uh, intermediaries who, who may be more comfortable with that was a point that came out there. I think in Hartford, one of the issues that came out was just doing the best we can to make sure that communities are aware of um, and community members are aware of implicit biases that come out in sort of more everyday interactions and conversations and how that can feel unwelcoming even when community members may not fully understand what they're doing. So having more education interface around that. 
Um, Rutland, we heard uh, a lot from, I'd say, gender and sexual minorities who had felt um, quite unwelcome, unfortunately, in various circumstances uh, and service provision, and that was uh, one of the areas that came out strongly in that forum. When I say that, those categories that I said, those were personal observations about things that were emphasized differently. I'd say a lot of different issues. These are two-hour forums that we're having. A lot of different issues come out at each of them, so I don't want to make it seem like that was the only thing that was happening at each one or um, dismissive of voices that had other things to say. But I, I think from our office's perspective, they've been really important. I think we have learned and um, we are going to be assimilating that. I think our goal is to have a final, we don't just want it to be a sort of trauma tourism, to use a denigrating term, for what some folks might view us as doing, going around the state and making people talk about all the tough things that have happened to them. We do want this to ultimately result in some change and some sort of action items that we will act on. And so our goal is at the end of the forums, to produce a document that we hope to distribute to as many of the attendees as we can. We're not, not entirely sure we'll get everybody because the sign-ins aren't always complete, but we'll do the best we can to make everybody who came to those forums feel like we have heard what people were saying, we're internalizing it, and we're gonna try to turn it into uh, change in terms of how we operate and how we work with uh, state agencies and community partners. And will you be available when the report comes out in November? Yes. Are there other questions for Dave? I know you said um, that data collection is something that uh, that the panel is looking at, and there's a bill in the House 284 talking about data collection that's pretty comprehensive. Is that something that the panel, I don't know if you've had this specific discussions about that bill, would that be something that might be included in your recommendations on taking further action on that, or do you think we need more? I, I don't, again, I'm hesitant to speak on behalf of the panel for what they might do. We, we would certainly support um, data collection that would include data collection from lawyers, and I use that term broadly to include prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges. Um, I think one of the things that's rather opaque is we have data at the beginning of the process, which is the police stops, and we have data at the end of the process, which is who is incarcerated or under supervision of the Department of Corrections, and we have relatively little visibility into what happens in those those things. So more data coming in around that is something we support. Um, I think I wouldn't want to comment on any specific bill right now, but certainly, and, but I should say the concepts behind 284, I haven't read 284, the concepts behind 284 are something that we generally are fully in agreement with. I think it will take a little work to produce a workable bill that can actually be, um, that our people can do operationally and that will have um, data collection that's reliable across the board. But uh, conceptually, yes, I think something like that would be important. So, uh, representative, <laughs> call me Senator. Alice. It's call me Alice. Alice, please. <laughs> uh, I have a question, and I don't even know if anybody can answer it. But are you looking in or having any concerns about what's going to be happening over the next? 14 months as we enter into a political presidential election that may really escalate some situations that right now are sort of undercover or happening that may not be happening, but the political arena is going to really get intense next year. And has there been any discussions on what that may look like here in Vermont? It's an ongoing concern, and it, the reality is that we do have a rise in bias-motivated incidents and hate crimes, and at least anecdotally, I'm not sure if we have statistical, you know, like rock-solid statistical data we can point to, but at least anecdotally, it certainly does seem to be the case, and I, I would say personally it is the case that it is related to the political environment that we are living in and to um, our leadership in Washington and the White House. I think that's, a, that's a plain reality, and I think that as we go forward on through this election, it's going to be a continuing concern. It is something that's a, that our office pays a lot of attention to and talks about frequently, um, and especially our, our civil rights unit with uh, Julio Thompson. I think 
if you want to go more into that topic, I would recommend setting aside some time for him to testify. I'm sure he'd be happy to talk about it. He's sort of the head in our office focused on that topic. Are we seeing situations at all? I mean, are you seeing or anyone seeing situations dealing with white supremacy that's really starting to come to the surface here? Some, is it some, still yeah, undercurrent? Yeah. Is it still an undercurrent? White supremacy? I wouldn't say, no, no, I think that um, a good number of the events that we're hearing about are related to white supremacy and explicit white supremacist ideology. There are those. And then there's the data regarding the justice system, yeah. juvenile and adult. And I think that to some extent we have to keep them separate. Those are incidents, and how do we deal with those incidents, and how do we educate people that it's inappropriate behavior? Seriously. I mean, I spent my life working with delinquent kids, and I had to teach them that. You know, leaning against the door and then walking into the store and stealing stuff, you know, you can lean against the door, but it's inappropriate to steal the stuff. I and mean, he, he argued he didn't break in because leaned he leaned the against door. the door and the door opened. <laughs> so I could therefore steal the stuff. Teaching people what's inappropriate and so forth is what ultimately will get us out of this. And, and you know, not allowing that behavior to be acceptable. And unfortunately, it seems like we're more and more accepting some of this behavior. So, I mean, I, I think the data collection is very important, but I was thinking about my comment about two persons of color being at Woodside. I don't know. They might have been there because they were older teens, and that's the only place they could go. It may have been because they were 17 it, and had nothing to do with anything else. So, I mean, it, we have the data, but you know, sometimes with our numbers are so small that it may not tell us the whole truth. Um, but we do know that things are happening, and so I'm looking forward to the report and then having everybody back on the November 13th. The mm -hmm. state house may be closed, but we'll find a place to meet and let you know where it is. We have actually the state house is going under renovations or doing something that's going to be closed on the third. So I have to find another oh, like, battery. Is it IT? Yeah. Oh, we're going to improve yeah, our IT. System? It's the battery, the backup. So, are there any other questions for David? If not, um, thank you, David. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you on the 13th. And Mark Hughes will be in on the 13th as well as scheduled. If you are available on the 13th of November. Yes, sir. And our next witness is Christine Longmore, who was the first chair of the uh, juvenile, criminal and juvenile justice system as advisor. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you all for an opportunity to testify. Um, a lot of times it's, it's hard to figure out what to say because there's so much to say. So I'm just going to say um, a little bit and submit my handwritten testimony. This is actually a, a, one of the folders that I have from all the work that we did in the, uh, in the panel. So I'm not here to testify. I'm, I mean, I'm here today to testify not because so much that I'm grateful for a seat at your table in your space or in your state house. I'm here because I'm committed to standing up for racial just justice. People, including children, are suffering. Changing that should be a priority with resources and results-based accountability. We've made some progress, but not enough. Years ago, we talked about the disproportionate contact with brown and black people as experience with the police. Local law enforcement responded by saying, it could be our perception. We responded by saying, we need to collect data to truly define the issue. Data has been collected, and the facts are clear. Black and brown people in Vermont are not safe, including children. A question that is central to this issue and has, has to be answered on an individual basis 
and, a system, and from a systematic perspective in our justice system and all state system systems is, this is the question, are black and brown people inherently more criminal or is it our justice system unfair and systematically racist? One of these statements is true and they are mutually exclusive. Once you decide what you believe, you should use your answer to guide your work as public servants. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions for anyone? Thank you. Um, so we'll take this up again when we have the report. And if uh, other people who want to testify besides Mark Hughes, um, just contact Peggy um, Delaney over there. So we're going to meet again on um, Peggy and I and members of the Legislative Council and over a number of reports that are coming in and a whole bunch of them are due and we set this December 1st and December 15th. <laughs> So it would require us, I think, to have two meetings in December. I was planning on only having one. Um, but we have the Youthful Offender Expansion Benchmark Report, December 1st. Oh, uh, November 15th, the Corrections and Healthcare Report. We're going to see if we can get that report moved up. The Presumptive Parole Report, December 15th. Juvenile Jurisdiction Report from the Sentencing Commission, December 15th. And then we have the Justice Reinvestment Areas of Study due around December 15th. So, um, what did we settle? December 10th and December 17th. I know that Mary wasn't able to make one of those meetings. It would be the 17th because yeah. so the I, I can't be either one. That week. Yeah. Did you and Skyler you wasn't able to make one of them. Probably not. Uh, uh, Tuesdays are just totally out of point. Um, I teach that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, Santa Lyons also can't make the either one of those dates, but she did fill out the Google poll, so that's why we didn't know. Oh. I can make my fault. Mia Culpa. No, I can make the 10th and 17th. So the 10th and 17th. You can't make the time. No, I can't. Oh, yeah, I can make both. I can try sorry, and arrange my schedule to get here for yeah. one of them. I'll see what I can do. And then November 8th. So November 8th, we're going up to St. Albans? Yes, yeah. November 8th is the trip to St. Albans. November 8th. November 8th. Yeah. And then do we meet again on November? I think we'll start that meeting at 13? 11. Oh, I guess it was 11? Yeah. Well, it's a long Travel. Way. you got to travel yeah. up. Okay. Representative Shaw has a long distance. No, you're going to carpool, right? Yeah. We'll carpool up. That'll okay. Pick. Well, okay. still a long okay. way. At 11. Two and a half. The eighth at 11 to 3. Because we'll have lunch there and we can continue to meet during lunch. So in October, we only have one meeting. One meeting. Yeah. We couldn't get it right. very many people in October. Vacation time. And then um, Commissioner Schatz wanted me to extend the invitation if anybody wants to do a tour of the inside. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's, I'll send an email out to you guys and have a chance to do it. Yeah. Is there a day or yeah. a morning? 45. I guess to be determined. Yeah. And then also one other reminder about the conference at the Vermont Law School. Um, you'll be getting an email from me about that on September 27th. The children's oh, that's the juvenile justice people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank JFC, the JFO briefing for what to say. Oh, I uh, uh, had that come out somewhere. Oh, that's in December. Is that the first part of December? Yep. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah.
usually that's right after Thanksgiving. Yes, the week after Thanksgiving. Oh, that's because Thanksgiving. Don't they usually put it together in the same? Are we done yet? Okay. So the 10th and the 17th, I'll try and figure out. December. 